recognition to express our gratitude to an exceptional team at the heart of our city's response to homelessness. In 2022, my team and I created the Street Services Coordination Center, or SSCC, through an emergency declaration. This initiative was aimed at enhancing and streamlining the city's efforts in addressing what's obviously a very complex issue, homelessness. It's my honor to acknowledge the outstanding work of the SSCC's leadership team, Nate Takara, the incident commander, the Silver Brothers, Matthew and Michael Silva, who are our incident leads, and Kim James, the first ever outreach director for the city of Portland. Their collective efforts have resulted in tangible, life-changing outcomes for many of Portland's homeless individuals. They have not only provided access to shelter and essential services, but also a pathway to permanent housing embodying the spirit of public service, and more importantly, compassion. Through Oregon All-In funding, they were able to move over 100 individuals from shelter into permanent housing just from mid-October through January. This is truly a remarkable achievement. Their work reflects their dedication, innovation, and humanity, and it serves as an inspiring model of what we can accomplish when we work together. After comments from my colleagues, if they'd wish, I'll read a formal recognition document. But before that, I'd like to present a video that my team had produced that offers a look into the city's first temporary alternative shelter site at Clinton Triangle. This is a good place to start a new life. I don't see why anyone wouldn't want to get a fresh start here. I've learned a lot and really am looking forward to getting housing so I know what to do for next time, you know. They teach me really good housing skills, which is really great. We came here because we were sleeping in our car under the Hawthorne Bridge. Cody's been on the streets for six years. I've been houseless for four. Um, you know, couch surfed and different stuff. For us, we feel like this is the opportunity that we never dreamed was possible to perpetuate living life instead of surviving. Both being clean, walking out of here clean, into a house, into situations where, you know, we have our ID, we have our social security card. They, Urban yes, Alchemy helped us get those things. So we're, you know, I already applied for a job. Folks that I hire all have some kind of experience being in, you know, involved in negative behaviors. They've been imprisoned. They've been living on the streets. They've been in drug addictions. They might have been in gangs. Um, but they've made choices to turn their lives around and now want to give back. On October 4th, I OD'd. And um, if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be here. Uh, one of the workers did CPR on me for 20 minutes and he, he saved my life. I have told people to come here, to get off the streets, and if, if they give a shot, their life will change. We have a regular cadence of other providers coming on site to provide services. We have medical, dental, um, mental health. We have addiction services coming in. We also have housing services. I came here to Portland almost five years ago. Um, been on the streets ever since. I haven't had ID in almost eight years, and they helped get my ID for me, pay for it, um, so I got ID now. And yeah, they've just been extremely helpful. I would also like to recognize that a number of people on my staff have worked alongside all of these great people that we're recognizing today. And in particular, I want to recognize Skylar Rocker Knapp, as well as Hank, there's Skylar, hey Skylar, uh, as well as Hank Smith from my staff for their hard work as well. 
Uh, so, colleagues, before I read the recognition document, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Commissioner Maps, then Commissioner Ryan. Actually, can I defer to my friend, uh, Commissioner Dan Ryan? He's Absolutely. been such a champion here. Um, I'll go after you, Commissioner, if you don't mind. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, yeah, I know uh, you and I, Mayor, we worked uh, closely on the building of this. And when we were first opening up the the um, villages, I felt like I had Nate on speed dial. And so I kind of want to publicly apologize for almost harassing you daily um, <laughs> about every little incident. Um, but what I it learned is how responsive you were and your team. And it was really a game changer once that system was built. And it's just been um, so much different once we had a place to actually call. And then through that, Portlanders, more importantly, Portlanders had a place to call. And then the synergy between that and 311 really took off. So here's to building. We keep working out the kinks. And what I really do want to end with is that you have such a continuous improvement mentality. So I never got any righteousness or this is the way it is. It was like, we're building something. Let's be creative. Let's figure out how to do this right. Always with a, um, with a compassionate heart and being very um, thoughtful about meeting people where they were and doing a lot of training to make sure that you were trauma informed on how you dealt with all the clients and the, and the participants and the Portlanders that we were reaching out to. So anyway, bravo that we built this. It's really been a game changer. And I know we um, also worked with the county throughout that journey. And so when people think that we're not innovating, we're not building in this time of crisis and getting results, um, we know we are, but it sometimes takes a while. And so we're starting to feel those the impact of that. But I was with you at the beginning. It was rough to get that built, and we had a lot of pushback. So anyway, thank you, staff, and thank you, Portlanders, for um, dialing 311 and working with the system. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Ryan. Uh, Commissioner Maps. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Mr. Mayor, I want to thank you for bringing this item forward, and I want to thank my colleagues, uh, Dan Ryan, the mayor, and frankly, I think everyone on this council has played some role in helping this program stand up. Um, I will tell you, um, I also want to thank our uh, street services coordination uh, um, team. Uh, they, as we have learned today, have done um, work that is saving lives and changing lives. Um, this is some of the most important work being done in the city. I think one of the most important things about this particular project is that not only is it saving lives, it's actually pointing towards a model that has proven to be successful in getting people off the streets um, into a safe place. And one of the things that we didn't really unpack in that presentation is <clears throat> we're having remarkable success moving people from um, these temporary shelters to more permanent and supportive housing. Um, this is a model that works. It's proven. Um, I want to congratulate everyone who um, helped make it happen. I also want to point out that if we are going, going to continue this work in the future, we need our partners at the state and county level to join us and uh, um, to make sure that we continue to um, uh, make programs like this uh, um, the, the way we do business on a day-to-day -day basis. And I look forward to working with this council to make sure that that is what we're one's future looks like. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Maps. Commissioner Gonzalez. Uh, I want to echo my colleagues' uh, comments here and also just want to emphasize a component for both Commissioner Ryan and for Mayor Wheeler, uh, the push for first safe rest villages and task sites and uh, taking direct uh, interaction on what we were seeing on our streets took political courage. And at a time when uh, very few in the city were willing to do that, uh, they were criticized from all ends, uh, faced opposition from all ends uh, at times, and they pushed forward. And um, that's uh, sometimes unique in the city of Portland. Um, we're not where we need to be as a community. We've got a long road to go. Um, but they took important steps forward. Uh, they, they held the line. They clear, set clear expectations of balancing compassion with expectations for how folks conduct themselves in the public. And for that, I applaud them uh, and I'm very happy to celebrate the teams that have been implementing this uh, from day one. Thank, that, thank you, Commissioner, Commissioner Rubio. Thank you, Mayor. I just also want to join my colleagues in congratulating um, Kim, Matthew, Michael, and Nate. Thank you for your continued dedication to public service. And also, I want to acknowledge the great work of Urban Alchemy and the heart that they really bring to this work. Um, connecting unhoused individuals to services and shelters can be really difficult and often thankless. Uh, but we see you and appreciate all the hours that you and your team put in 
to making a difference in people's lives. I also want to really lift up Mayor Wheeler and Commissioner Ryan. Thank you so much for your vision and your leadership here. Um, there, were, there was a lot of work. There was a lot of conversations. You got a lot of pushback, but you knew it was the right thing to do, and it was then, and it still is now. And um, the commitment to collaborative work across the bureaus to make these things happen uh, and in the communities and neighborhoods, it's very evident in the outcomes of this work. So I want to thank everyone connected to this, um, this progress. And as others have mentioned, um, it, we still have work to do, but uh, we are on, on a good path. So thank you all. Thank you. Um, and uh, I want to really appreciate Kim, Nate, Matthew, and Michael. Um, they asked not to have to speak today. I would give them the opportunity if they would like to. Um, but certainly we don't require anybody to do that. Very good. So I will read, uh, this is a recognition on behalf of the entire city council and by extension the city of Portland for our extreme gratitude for the work that you have done. Everybody asked for a proof of concept. Very few people were willing to get behind this model when it was an idea. You are the ones who brought that proof of concept to life. You are the ones who did the hard work. You are the ones who made it happen and made it the success that it is today. And that's why we want to recognize you today. And I see a lot of good people in this room who work with Urban Alchemy uh, and others who are working really hard to help people to get off the streets, connect them with services, and help them move on with their lives. Whereas I, Mayor Ted Wheeler, and my team did recognize a critical need to address homelessness in our city, we established the Street Services Coordination Center, the SSCC, in 2022 through an emergency declaration aiming to streamline and enhance the efforts of city bureaus engaged in homeless-related services. And whereas Nate Takara, with his remarkable leadership and strategic vision, was appointed as the incident commander of the SSCC, playing a pivotal role in orchestrating a coordinated response to the homelessness crisis on Portland Street. And whereas Matthew and Michael Silva, as dedicated incident leads in the SSCC, have tirelessly worked as incredible problem solvers who think outside of the box and are able to deal with a multitude of complex situations, significantly contributing to the outreach and support of homeless individuals in need of assistance. And whereas Kim James, in her role as the first ever outreach director for the city of Portland, has led with compassion and with innovation, ensuring that outreach efforts are both humane as well as effective. And whereas under their combined leadership, this team has made thousands of meaningful contacts with homeless individuals in Portland, demonstrating a profound commitment to understanding and then addressing their needs. And whereas through their steadfast efforts, hundreds of homeless Portlanders have been successfully transitioned into shelters, connected with essential services, and guided towards a path to permanent housing. And whereas this small, efficient, yet mighty team has not only saved lives, but also profoundly changed them for the better, embodying the spirit of public service and true compassion. And whereas their service to the community, while immeasurable, has played a critical role in achieving the Oregon All-In Navigation and Outreach Milestone Achievements, setting a benchmark for future homeless outreach initiatives. And whereas through Oregon All-In funding, the team was able to move over 100 individuals from shelter to housing just since mid-October. And whereas the impact of their work extends beyond immediate relief, offering hope and a renewed sense of dignity to those that they serve, thereby strengthening the overall fabric of our community. And whereas their dedication and achievements serve as an inspiring testament to what can be accomplished through commitment, collaboration, and a deep sense of humanity. And whereas their contributions have laid the groundwork for a more compassionate and effective approach to addressing unsheltered homeless individuals in our city. Now, therefore, I, Ted Wheeler, Mayor of the City of Portland, Oregon, do hereby express 
the city's deepest gratitude and official recognizing official recognition of Kim James, Matthew Silva, Michael Silva, and Nate Takara of the Street Services Coordination Center's leadership team for their extraordinary dedication to the Portland community and their exceptional public service. Thank you. And uh, if we could do a group photo up here in front, uh, that would be fun. Thank you all. Appreciate you. Wow, what happened to my gavel? Uh oh, it's like he's made out of plastic. Wow. <laughs> well, good morning, everybody. This is the January 31st, 2024 morning session of the Portland City Council. Keelan, please call the roll. Good morning. Rubio. Here. Ryan. Here. Gonzalez. Here. Maps. Here. Wheeler. Here. Now we'll hear from legal counsel on the rules of order and decorum. Good morning. Welcome to the Portland City Council. To testify before council, in person or virtually, you must sign up in advance on the council agenda at www.portland.gov backslash council backslash agenda. Information on engaging with city council can be found on the council clerk's webpage. The presiding officer preserves order and decorum during city council meetings. The presiding officer determines the length of testimony, Individuals generally have three minutes to testify unless otherwise stated. A timer will indicate when your time is done. Disruptive conduct, such as shouting, refusing <coughs> to conclude your testimony when your time is up, or interrupting others, or council deliberations, will not be allowed. If you cause a disruption, a warning will be given. Further disruption will result in ejection from the meeting. Anyone who fails to leave once ejected is subject to arrest for trespass. Additionally, council may take a short recess and reconvene virtually. Your testimony today should address the matter being considered. When testifying, state your name for the record. Your address is not necessary. Disclose if you are a lobbyist. If you are representing an organization, please identify it. For testifiers joining virtually, please unmute yourself once the council clerk calls your name. Thank you. All right, thanks. First up is communications. First individual, please, Keelan, item 85. Request of Peter Cocapelli to address council regarding bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure. Uh, Peter's joining us online. Welcome, Peter. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Peter Cocapelli, and I'd like to thank you, the mayor and the commissioners, for inviting me into the council. It's my first time. I would like to discuss today daylighting which is also called vision clearance by PBOT. And that's the concept of opening up intersections by moving parked cars away from crosswalks to make them safer and more visible. I live near 68th and Belmont. This is what the street corner looks like when you try to cross the street. This is not a high crash street, but there was an accident here not long ago involving two cars. This kind of situation is not safe for drivers or for anybody else. PBOT has already completed vision clearance at 350 intersections on high crash streets. 
They cost only $800 per intersection. It's a really good deal. And first off, I want to thank the council commissioners for making that happen. It's a really good first step. However, there are many intersections not protected on safe routes to schools, on bus routes, on streets like Belmont that are, you know, with, where people are walking to school and trying to get to a bus stop and neighborhood greenways as well. On Monday, a car hit a child in a crosswalk at Woodstock Elementary. And part of the problem was that there was a car obscuring the view of the child. What I would propose, provide funding for daylighting in these areas, neighborhood greenways, pedestrian priority streets, schools, and on bus routes. I'd also suggest that you use PCEP funding. This would be a fabulous use for PCEP funds. $2 million would do thousands of intersections. We've already shown that with the pilot study that, that PBOT has done. I would also suggest that you expand street painting permits, get the community involved, and let them paint curbs and corners to outline and daylight intersections. I'm ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> PBOT's done a great job with this. It supports Vision Zero. It saves lives. This is one of these small steps that is, would really help bring down the traffic fatalities and accidents. <laughs> Daylighting builds on Portland's reputation as a walkable and friendly city. <laughs> Thank you for supporting Daylighting and for your time today. You got uh, 15 seconds for questions. <laughs> great. Hey, Peter, thank you. That was, a, that was an excellent presentation. Thank and, you. And I really appreciate it. Commissioner Maps is our transportation commissioner, and he has a comment as well. Sure. Uh, um, I very much agree with the mayor. Peter, really excellent testimony. Um, great idea. As you pointed out, Peabot embraces daylighting. I'd like to expand it, too. I'll tell you, I live kind of in your neighborhood, so I know exactly the dynamics that you're talking about. It can be quite scary and difficult to try to cross some of these streets, given uh, uh, um, where we allow cars to park. I'm committed to making our transportation transportation system uh, safer. Um, again, resources are going to be a big problem. In the coming weeks and months, you're going to see me unveil the Peabot's budget, and that's going to require, at this point, about $35 million in cuts. But even as we right-size the Bureau, one of the things I'm deeply committed to is continuing to make progress on making our streets safer. Daylighting is going to be uh, part of the solution, and I really appreciate you um, highlighting the opportunities that we have in this space. So thanks for being here, and thanks for the great thinking. Uh, Peter, could I just ask one quick question? And, mm -hmm. and again, uh, great presentation, and I agree with you. And blocked corners are, are sort of one of my pet peeves, so I'm completely in alignment with you. Y you mentioned PSAP as a possible source of funding. Could, could you make the case for that? Yeah, I think that the uh, the big case is that this, I, I emphasize this is a problem for everybody. Even drivers are incredibly annoyed, and it causes accidents. But I feel it most when I'm a pedestrian, and especially I'm walking with my grandson. I mean, you're just almost halfway out into the street before you can get across, and that's just to get to the bus stop. I'm also a transit rider. So if you're looking at the climate goals for PSEF and you're trying to remove obstacles, this is a really cheap way to do it. Mm. You know, it's those, I think people use the term nudges. This is one of those little nudges that, that will push people in the wrong direction with that bad experience they have at an uh, ongoing street corner. I think that's a compelling case. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Uh, Commissioner Maps. Sure. I want to point out that, well, I, I would love to explore with uh, the PSEF community uh, the opportunities to fund these uh, fund projects like this through with those funds. I'll tell you, colleagues, um, given the price of this particular innovation, um, I hope that we can take a look at other possible uh, sources of funds for this, too. Um, well, I think anyone who has tried to cross these streets or streets like this um, in Portland knows how dangerous they are. Uh, Peter's pointed out it's relatively cheap cheap to fix. Um, it would be great to make progress in this area. It's truly one of the rare low-hanging fruits in the transportation space, and I hope that we could work together to make this um, a, a, a more widespread practice. Awesome. Thank Thanks. you, sir. Thank you, Peter. Uh, next right. Thank you again. Please. Thank you, Peter. Next individual, 86, please. 
Request of Jessica Johnston to address council regarding deteriorating livability, crime, and Portland public school strike. They canceled their request. All right. Uh, next individual, please, item 87. Request of Ian Williams to address council regarding current state of business operations and sentiments in Old Town. Welcome. Yeah. Thanks. Trying to get close to the middle a little bit. Uh, when do I begin? Uh, whenever you'd like. Hey, shout and, out. And then, uh, since this is sort of a new system, can you walk us through the lights just so oh, we all understand? Well, actually, it's the same timer. I'll start it so you can see it. Oh, he okay. can see it on the screen here. Yep. Got it. Yep. Okay. Oh, my timer already started? All right. No, no, no. Uh, I don't. When you start it. So oh. All right. Y'all ready? My name is Ian Williams. Uh, I'm the owner of Deadstock Coffee. Uh, I have had the opportunity to speak to many already. Uh, and I just really wanted to come through and uh, on behalf of some people in Old Town and really talk about uh, what's going on down there. So Old Town has been the cultural hub uh, since black people were first brought here in the late 1800s, early 19s. And we turned it into a place uh, where we were brought to build the railroads. Um, and our neighborhood was flanked by other communities, other Asian communities who were also brought here. And we turned it into something great. Um, and, uh, you know, we've always been underrepresented, I feel. Uh, we've always been a neighborhood... Uh, that is underserved, um, but we are very proud of our neighborhood. And I say all that to say that uh, we will always figure it out. Um, we all know that the narrative of Old Town is that Old Town is dirty, uh, there's a lot of houseless people, uh, drugs and all those things. Um, you know, we feel that right to dream actually govern the area. Um, and we actually, a lot of us business owners feel strongly about right to dream, it was a good thing. Um, in 2019, we were really expecting the neighborhood to turn the corner. Of course, 2020 happened, uh, and when others boarded up and decided to, uh, you know, shut down and got, you know, due to COVID and riots and things like that, our neighborhood actually stood together and made sure that we, um, we actually were outside protecting our businesses at night to make it seem like everything was all good during the day. Um, and so, you know, even though all those things were good for us, you know, that still fell on hard times and, uh, and you know, drugs were spreading and looting and all those things. So, uh, you know, we really just wanted to really want to be here to, to actually ask for help. Um, we, as the businesses, uh, I can I have a listener if you want. Um, we have a new set of rules that we would like to go through, uh, that we would like to go by. Uh, I know it's going to be hard, but number one, I'd like to say that I would like for it, we would like for it to be a coordinated effort. Um, we know that we can't do it by ourselves, and Old Town has always thrived on collaboration. Um, I wish I had pictures and stuff like my man Peter, but, uh, but you know, uh, our, our goal is uh, our, the things that we just can no longer tolerate are uh, the tents and camping. Um, no garbage cans in Old Town. We feel that that brings a lot of uh, opportunities for um, rodents and things like that. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, it's just sad to watch people dig through the garbage cans and things like that. No loitering if you're not uh, working or uh, patronizing one of the businesses. Um, we really would like to stand for no uh, open air drug use. Um, and then to, again, uh, double down and say that we'd really like for this to be a coordinated effort. You know, like I mentioned before, we're always going to figure it out. Um, we're asking for assistance to uplift those who really want to be in Old Town. We're asking for assistance to help uh, with those who are in need and to also help with cleaning up our streets. Uh, we're asking for you to work with us to bring back the culturally vibrant neighborhood that Old Town has always been, and we still feel strongly about it. Um, we're asking for help through a collaborative effort, but we're also uh, telling you that without this help, we will still continue to fight. Ian, thank you. I, I think a couple of us have a, a couple of, of comments. And, uh, yeah. Commissioner Gonzalez. Uh, Mr. Williams, thanks so much for your testimony. A, a couple quick questions. Uh, what steps have you had to take as a business owner uh, to protect yourself, your employees, and your business in recent years in Old Town? Yeah, I mean, since uh, like up to 2021, we've been there since 2015. Um, we had never replaced any windows uh, from 2021. Actually, just in the last calendar year, we've had to replace five um, in the business alone, not, a, not you know, my car as well, but uh, like business car. Um, and then we have three that are currently broken. Um, but when we hire people, our first conversation is, what would you do if something happened? If somebody comes in and, you know, they're going through whatever episode it might be, and if the number one answer is call the police, we actually say that you can't work with us. We just, we do what we can to to continue to be part of the community and understand that people are going through things, but it's getting more and more dangerous for people to be down there, uh, for employees and, you know, if there's tents, people won't park in those areas and things like that. So do what we can to 
protect our team and our businesses. Have you seen uh, an increase in the number of business owners that find it necessary to carry guns, to own guns, and keep them on, on site? I would say, yeah. Um, during that time when all the protesting and uh, honestly, like, the protests never came into Old Town. They would hit Burnside, turn, go somewhere, go a different direction. But all the, but so many businesses got their windows broken, places were broken into that were boarded up. So people must have known that something was in there. Um, so I will say that I, I didn't, but there were a lot of people who carried guns and who slept out in front of their stores or well, stayed up in front of their stores through the evenings uh, to make sure that everything was going to be okay. Um, and like I said, and then pretend that everything was fine when we opened the next day. Uh, so again, I, I'm not a big weapons guy, but I know people who do legally, you know, who, who have taken those precautions. I actually carried a backpack with a screwdriver or like drill and stuff and just help people board up. Got it. No, that's beautiful. And I, I only bring it up because we certainly have heard that, that, you know, with the loss of expectation of justice and protection in, in old town, that many had to resort to self-protection in a way that they didn't previously consider. And, sure. um, you know that to me, it's part of the seriousness of an is of the issue uh, for for your neighborhood and for neighborhoods throughout the city. I do want to highlight a couple of pieces that this council's uh, steps we've taken. We know it's not enough. We know we need to do more. But we banned outdoor drug use last summer, and we're waiting for the state to allow us to enforce it. Uh, that was this council going five zero because we were listening to Portlanders like you. They were fed up with what they're seeing on the streets. Uh, second, we put in place time, place manner restrictions uh, and took a long time to actually roll it out in enforcement, then get to the end and have a judge uh, enjoin us from enforcing it. Uh, it is extremely frustrating. Uh, we need help from the courts and from the state legislature, frankly, uh, to fix some really poorly thought out statutes there. Um, we'll continue to fight. Uh, we need partners on, on that. Uh, last but not least, you know, this is a town that loves to talk about equity. Uh, we, we talk about it every day in City uh, Hall. But when I look at the impact that crime has had on our communities of color, uh, our business owners of all races, uh, and all socioeconomic classes, that's where I get really frustrated because we've talked nonstop about equity and yet the folks that are getting the most impact by crime and drug use are some of our most historically marginalized communities. And I'm not necessarily saying that about Old Town, but it is part of the, that narrative and that story as you alluded to. So again, thank you for your testimony. Please continue to speak up. We'll look forward to collaborating with, uh, with you on these hard problems. Appreciate it. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely be back. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Ryan. Yeah, sure. I just wanted to thank you for coming in. I had a pleasure of meeting you over two years ago, and um, fortunately I've been frequently in communication with you because <clears throat> you instantly just told me the truth about what it's like to be a small business owner in Old Town. And I have a couple questions just because I'm actually following up. I know I saw you a couple weeks ago, but we didn't get to these points. Um, when you do make a phone call, what, what, what do you dial? Right now, we just dial, I just call non-emergency, because the majority of the time, it's not, yeah, 311 is not an emergency, or at least we it, we understand. It's difficult because our under, our neighborhood is this, it's like a small, like a microclimate, right? I mean, all neighborhoods are, but, but a lot of us have been there for so long, we understand the way that the neighborhood operates. When you bring in, though I'm asking and hoping for more police presence, when police presence comes in the way that police presence comes in now, it's not looked, it's not received well. Say more. Um, when it's very similar to how people who grew up in the hood, I'm kind of using this loosely, uh, don't drive white cars. Uh, we understand that white cars mean something not good is about to happen. So when the way that people perceive or the way that the, the community perceives police right now, it's that something good is, is something bad is about to happen. Um, so when people are approached uh, with kindness and respect, but also when they're approached with, with something that's very stern, they're um, more receptive uh, to, to help or to whatever the uh, conversation or the situation might entail. Um, so though I'm hoping, I, I wish we had more police presence, um, but police presence in the way that is like, hey, we're here to help you. And I know that that's difficult because police are um, under underfunded, under-supported, under all those things. And I'm not saying that any knock on y'all. I just, you know, nobody calls the police to ask them how they're doing, right? Everybody calls when something's wrong, so, yeah. yeah. So the bike patrols and 
seeing the police force on their feet. Yeah, yeah. And, the, and the bike patrol, I will say, has actually been very helpful. That's what I mean. Yeah. Okay, great. And then, um, Mayor, you led a really great effort with the 90-day reset, and I know that had a, an impact. What have you, what, any reflection on how that worked, and what about the follow-up? Yeah, the, the first 90-day reset, I'll be completely honest, I was unaware it even took place. Oh. Um, the second 90-day reset, or the beginning of that reset, I was made aware that there was a previous 90-day reset. Uh, we spoke at the same place, Mayor Wheeler, um, in front of the gardens, the Chinese gardens. Um, and I feel that it was, it was good in that uh, it, the streets did get cleaned and there were tents and things that were removed. Um, but what it actually, there was, a, there was an ecosystem that has always been there of people who just actually need help um, and who have been able to live and, and, and function uh, in downtown who are houseless. Uh, but really what it did is I, we all feel that it removed the people who were there who needed help and really opened up the doors for people who are just down there to do stuff that they didn't have any business doing. Um, and with everybody knowing that uh, it was pretty clear that Portland was not really enforcing a lot of rules and a lot of laws. There were people who came to town and the Greyhound station was definitely one of those places where people arrive at. And which made that, which made Old Town the neighborhood that bore the brunt of a lot of that, um, the things that were happening, uh, drug sales, um, windows getting broken, people getting injured, and uh, and so are getting getting hurt due to you know different violence and things like that. So uh, the 90 day reset was helpful in that it did the streets were clean for a moment, but then it just opened it up for other people to come in and replace and take up those spaces and. And uh, I mean, I'll be honest, a lot of business owners are getting pretty fed up and there's a lot of more stern conversations, nobody fighting, nobody hurting anybody, but it definitely is getting more, everybody's at like a wit's end. Yeah. And to, to um, my final question, I know that you said you had some broken windows. Were you able to get the repair grants from um, for Portland? We were told a bunch of different ways that we were supposed to submit our information to get the windows repaired. Initially, we had called, we were told to submit our invoices. Um, invoices got submitted, they didn't get paid. To be honest, uh, there's two of the broken windows, uh, the repairs that we're in collections for. Um, and I know that Prosper has reached out to us to help with that. Um, but I already feel like we thought that we gave the information the correct ways to get the windows replaced. And then they continue to get broken. So for us, I'm just like, why would I replace this window? I'd rather just leave it boarded or a little bit broken, um, which sucks. Thank you for showing up and giving a firsthand perspective. It's Appreciate very it. refreshing to um, have you share uh, with uh, with us and uh, more importantly with the public. Appreciate you so much. Thank you. Commissioner Maps. Um, Ian, thank you for uh, being here today and thank you. Thank you for everything that you do to uh, make Old Town and Portland a better place. I know I've met you and I've been down to your shop and you're a great addition to Portland. I also want you to know <clears throat> I very much heard what you've requested today. Uh, you know, action on tents, garbage cans, no lord loitering and open air. Uh, no open air drug use. Those are all things that I support too. I suspect that uh, my colleagues on council are uh, largely supportive of these suggestions too. I sure hope that we as a council can um, uh, get together and, and uh, figure out if there's a way forward to move on some of these. I think some uh, we can move on right away. Some might take a little bit more work, uh, including some support from the courts. And uh, Mr. Mayor, also, um, I was going to kind of try to tee you up. I know yesterday, um, yesterday, uh, you and the governor, I think the county chair came together uh, to unveil a 90-day state of emergency around fentanyl. Uh, and I was wondering if you could kind of educate us in the room and Portlanders about how that project is likely to um, impact and hopefully improve conditions in Old Town. Yeah, good. So, so let me say what I wanted to say first, and then I sure. will get to that. Um, first of all, Ian, you have stuck it out and I appreciate it, and I really, I mean that. Um, I also want you to know that we've been keenly aware of the situation in Old Town, and I'll be mayor for less than a year, and then somebody else will take up the mantle, and I hope they will continue to pursue some of the strategies that we've looked at. The reality is the 90-day reset that we did in Old Town was actually guided by community. 
we asked community, what do you need from us? And they said, we need more patrols, more police visibility. We need uh, livability improvements, litter and graffiti collection on a regular basis. Um, we need better homeless outreach, compassionate responses to people who are clearly struggling on the streets. And as you'll recall, two years ago in Old Town, it was every single block. There were a lot of people in really dire straits who needed um, significant help. And we created that 90 day reset and, and there were other components to it as well. Gun violence was actually, you know, it spiked in Old Town. And at the end of the 90 day reset, some things worked really well, some things didn't work so well. What did work well is gun violence went down to zero from one of the city's hotspots down to zero. So we, we liked that aspect of it. The livability piece, um, well, the outreach part, Obviously, we just did a celebration for some of the people who are heavily involved in that, sure. and I, I think that's been successful. It's a compassionate, effective, fact-based approach. Uh, but what didn't work, and what we all acknowledge, is when we focused on Old Town, things improved, just as you said, temporarily. But as soon as we folded up the tent and left, a lot of it came right back. And we did the same thing in the central east side. And we had basically the same experience. And so we realized, okay, we're not, you know, we're, we're helping some people, but we're not really solving the core problem because we're not being consistent in terms of what we're funding, what we're supporting, what our programming is. And so a lot of people expressed sort of the, the same concerns you have that, that they felt abandoned. And meanwhile, we had other parts of the city that are also struggling with some of these other issues, you know, safety, livability, homelessness, economic recovery, saying, why did you pick them? Why not us? You know, aren't, aren't we important to you in Lentz or Belmont or, or you know, East, anywhere in East Portland? And so what we've been working on since is called Portland Solutions. And Portland Solutions is not yet ready for prime time, but it is going to be operated like an emergency management function with daily resource allocation, complete coordination amongst all of our city bureaus, focus on addressing these issues on a permanent ongoing basis, not just in any given neighborhood, but all across the city. And I would very, very much welcome your input, your participation, your thoughts, your thought leadership at any level where you think the experience that you have in Old Town could help reflect that effort. Uh, briefly to the trilateral emergency declaration. Um, there are a lot of pieces of that that are still not completely clear. Um, at the outset, what it is, it's improved coordination and communication between the city, the county, and the state. But as I made clear in the press conference yesterday, we're already doing it. We already have the Street Services Coordination Center. We're already coordinating our bureaus. We're already deploying outreach teams, the urban alchemy folks in the city. Um, we are already providing access to treatment. We are providing access to behavioral services generally, as well as public health services. Um, and yes, we're standing up improved patrols. We're increasing our collaborations with the Oregon State Police. We, we, we are, the impact reduction program is doing, you know, uh, two thousand percent increase over 2017 numbers in terms of litter and graffiti abatement. But now the question is, how do the state and the county come into alignment with the work that we're already doing? How do they help us expand it, scale it, and as Ian said, make it permanent? Yep. And um, that remains to be seen, to be honest with you. But those are the discussions that are ongoing now. Uh, Commissioner Rubio. I just want to um, also join my colleagues in thanking you for sticking it out. I know it's been just a very rough set of years, and you, your voice has been uh, front and center. So thank you for being here and telling us the truth. We need to keep, you know, uh, keep aware on the ground what's real and versus um, – what maybe is just more aspirational and what we want to hear, but we need to work, know where the real work is put out. I just want to briefly follow up about the garbage aspect. That's something I can really get into right away. Um, so if you're okay with that, I would love to follow up with you or have my staff connect with you offline. I'd love to know what parts of the city are, would make would be more consequential um, in terms of help uh, for you. So if you're open to that, would love to connect with you about garbage. Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, I would say that would be tight. Great. Appreciate that. We appreciate your being yeah. here.
Thank you, guys. Support continuing. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Nice, nice shirt, sweatshirt. You want to say, don't want to to let me know. <laughs> uh, next item, please. Item number, or next individual, please. Item number 88. Request of Linda Wysong to address council regarding monuments and engagement Grants. grant. Welcome. Thank you for being here. I am not Linda Wysong, but my understanding is that it was switched for Michael Stevenson. Uh, hello again. Uh, the council members may remember seeing me when I spoke back in July. In case you need a reminder, I spoke in support of accepting the report on recommendations for the city from Portland's Monument Engagement Process Committee. At that time, there was unanimous agreement among the council to accept this proposed plan for community engagement to forefront citizens' voices as the basis for developing new and managing old monuments in the city of Portland. On the same day, the city, uh, the council voted to accept a $350,000 grant from the Mellon Foundation to fund that work. It may be that council members have read the OPB article written by Alex Zielinski entitled The Fate of Portland's Toppled Monuments Hits a Snag. When I appeared at city council in July, I left feeling excited for possible futures involving monumentalization in the city of Portland. After reading the article, I was disheartened and mortified at the state of affairs. I had already been tracking. There were, had not been signi any significant public engagement around the issue because I would have been there. I would like to read an excerpt from the article that is particularly clear about the non-compliance to the plan that this city council voted in favor of. It includes a quote from Commissioner Dan Ryan, whose portfolio includes the city arts program applauding the report as recently as July 2023. Quote, we are determined to create a thorough and inclusive process to ensure underrepresented communities are engaged in these discussions. He said, it's imperative to me that we handle the Portland Monuments Project with utmost care, and it sets an example for the nation on how we respond to conflict during these times of tension. The article further explains that those directly involved in the project say, Ryan didn't stick to his mindset in the months to follow. According to Amara Perez, who the city hired to serve as inquiry and engagement coordinator for the project, Ryan and his staff have been laser focused on a plan to return the five monuments to public spaces, end quote. This is bad press. I'm a citizen of Portland and I'm appalled to be directly implicated by having also been present when these supportive comments were made by Councillor Ryan. It is my personal integrity that is on the line when the city government does not follow through with plans and intentions made when I was in the room. This is why I have returned. I want to make it clear that the citizens of Portland are watching what is done here or not being done as the case may be, how money is spent and exactly whose voices are being listened to. I'm aware that there are conversations taking place about the York statue. For those of you who don't know, artist Todd Mc grain, guerrilla installed a monument honoring York, a black man who led Lewis and Clark westward. McGrain is an artist of a particular gender and cultural heritage that is predominant in the city and does not represent the widely diverse population within our municipal region. Resurrecting this three-year-old conversation is lazy and it represents a totally unimaginative approach to community engagement. It is disingenuously instrumentalizing the Oregon black pioneers as they were not approached to imagine their own vision for what to memorialize, instead brought a half-baked idea that was dreamt by a single Portlander. While endearing the, to the sculptor, this conversation quintessentially does not represent a broader community engagement, and neither is the paltry amount of time the issue Monuments has gotten with Dan Ryan's poorly promoted art talks. For example, my roommate, who is contracted by the city to do all public art street paintings, receives Dan Ryan's newsletter and had no idea the program was even happening. Almost done. Due to these grievous issues with how the council has managed this culturally significant issue, myself and other concerned Portlanders respond to this lack of appropriate diverse community engagement by convening our own community uh, conversation event to actually garner a broad perspective on the future of monumentalization in Portland. This event will be well promoted and open to the public. I will make sure to personally invite each of the city council members just in case you all have time in your busy schedules to address this very important issue. Thank you for your time and I hope you appreciate mine in return. Thank you for being here. Oh, uh, Commissioner Ryan. Yeah, would like to say something. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Michael, I, nice to see you. I know that my uh, senior staffer on this did reach out to Linda last night. They had a great conversation, so she has the balanced information. 
Um, sometimes in this job, we can all look at each other and admit we have some uh, news days that uh, when I read an article, I don't even recognize what I'm reading because it misses half of the information. And that was uh, true to that article that you were reading about. Uh, let's just back up a little bit. First, let's talk about the fact that we have the policy out for the public to review. It'll be a four-week review because Portland, like many cities, didn't have a policy on how to deal with uh, the conversation about looking at monuments that are up that really deserve to have some dialogue about why they're still there and who they're hurting. All of the issues that we talked about, especially in the Mellon Grant, and so we have that policy out. So we have a, a map going forward and not just um, a act people take it down and then we sit for four years and wonder what to do. So those days need to be over. So we do have that out. Um, in the July meeting, I was enthusiastic about it. And I was excited about the timeline that we all agreed upon, which was to start in the engagement as soon as possible and then come back with some findings in February. So all I was doing is getting that back on track because when I met with the arts office that was working on that in October, there wasn't any action that had taken place since July. So my job, was to make sure that, that we got back on track. So that's what we're doing. And you'll see in the policy that you can review that we have a great plan going forward. And that's action that we needed, the policy. And we'll review that and we'll vote on it in, in less than four weeks from now. And we will then um, tackle it uh, going forward. But there'll be plenty of engagement. There has been engagement, but there will be more. I would, I'll have Darian Jones also reach out to you and give you some more context on that. So thanks for being here. Sure. You know, I'm actually, uh, Linda forwarded me that plan, and so it's on the city website, and it was published yesterday. Yeah. Um, you know, four as you mentioned. Is, which uh, is a good, good, uh, four weeks is long period of time compared to most policies. Yeah. Sure. Um, you know, as you mentioned, that you started a conversation with your staff in October, and the plan was to do engagement from November for good decisions in June. So here we are several months into greater than multiples of four weeks, and we haven't heard anything. Um, you know, and I actually reviewed the website, and it says that it first, the first statement criminalizes, it engages in criminalization of participation. But if you'd like, the Seven Waters Canoe family is actually here today. So if you'd rather them move through this online portal, but they are ready to speak to you right now, um, about the issues and concerns, yeah. we could speak face to face about this. I mean, it's no longer COVID era where we should do things over the internet. We should have meetings. Absolutely. And just for the record, at the meeting in July, we all agreed to a timeline that said we would come back with an update on the engagement and some decisions based on that in February. Do you have updates on the engagement? The, the engagement team was um, slow in getting started. And that's really where the conflict started. And my job as an elected official for the people at a public meeting in July that agreed upon a timeline for six months, my job is to make sure we stay on that timeline. Anyway, thank you for being here. Just want to make sure I, I gave uh, the other side of that story. Thanks. Sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. Uh, next individual, please, item 89. Request of Anahid Bertrand to address council regarding Title 11 tree code hindrance for people with disabilities. P Bertrand is joining us online. Welcome. Thank you for being Hello. here. Hello. Um, I don't think, can you see me or? We, we can hear you, but we can't see you. You sound good, though. <laughs> um, here, start my video. Great. Oh, there you Thank are. Yeah, no, there you <laughs> Great. Thank you so much to um, letting me speak. I am speaking on behalf of myself as a person with disability um, and on behalf of my mother who has an intellectual disability. And I'm speaking about Title 11, uh, which um, says that we have to pay a penalty, $400 per inch for each tree removed if we want to build a house. And um, I love trees. Um, I think climate change is very, very important. And it's very urgent to protect our trees. However, I, I also, um, excuse me, I wanna show a, a story, my story of people with disabilities and how negatively we're impacted by this, uh, by Title 11. Um, rarely houses are built with um, consideration of our needs 
physical needs, mental needs, and sensory for people with um, sensory disability. And um, um, on top of that, um, there's a lot of cost in purchasing a home, trying to remodel it to fit those needs. And people with disabilities are often on a limited income. So um, that's why my mother and I decided to buy um, a purchase a lot and build our own home to fit those needs. Um, yes, the realtor misinformed us and didn't tell us about Title 11. And um, we found out later that we had to pay $100,000 in penalties just to remove the trees. And um, that really put a damper on our plans to be close to a hospital, to um, build a home that fits those needs, etc. And so, um, I just want to ask, is there any consideration in reducing those penalties for people with disabilities or is there a consideration of removing? Uh, because oftentimes what my experience is um, as an immigrant and um, person with disabilities is we always have to adapt to the system. We have to adapt our lifestyle, our way of being to the system. And can the system adapt to our needs? and consider that there are other people there and they need a voice as well. As much as we love trees, as much as we want climate change, um, there are real issues here with um, people with disabilities. So I'm, uh, um, I still have time, but I'm, I'm just gonna take this much time. Thank, thank, you. thank you, Ms. Bertrand. And, and I know uh, a couple of my colleagues would like to comment. Uh, Commissioner Gonzalez first, please. And Ms. Bertrand, thanks so much for your testimony. I am not a technical expert in this area. I want to start with that. This is not my uh, particular area, but I have been hearing a lot about trees in the uh, last week and a half, uh, in part because of the impact from the storm. Uh, I will just pass one tidbit to you that I'd encourage you, and then I'll turn over to my colleagues who have more direct uh, administrative responsibility. Um, have you have you consulted an arborist at, uh, on uh, the assessment here? Uh, because I have heard that uh, builders and homeowners in your situation have sometimes benefited uh, from the opinions of arborists as to what trees are really going to stand up in the next storm, so to speak, that can really change the uh, assessment as to what fees you might face. So I just I hope you've at least considered consulting an arborist that can uh, sometimes address the burdens under the existing code. I will add, and this is commentary more broadly, I, I think we need to take a serious look as a council, um, in part from the benefits of, of, of hindsight after looking at this last storm, uh, in part because we need to address the uh, construction of housing in our region and making it as affordable at all levels on the continuum. And this is one area where, you know, it is incredibly expensive uh, to build. Um, and so I, I just wanted to acknowledge both those pieces that I, I think the tree code is something that probably warrants a, a revisit by this council in light of recent developments and our need to build. But I just hope you've, you know, at least consider consulting an arborist on how to navigate the existing code. Thank you. I, I have to find one that doesn't also benefit from the code. There, is, yet, there is that challenge. Who <laughs> doesn't also work for, um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. But yeah, I think the storm has like a brought a new perspective to this issue. That's what I'm hearing. Hopefully. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. Commissioner Ryan. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, we've all uh, received quite a few emails about trees lately. And I'm proud to say that we uh, did move the work yesterday. The Parks Bureau had the authority to make that decision. We've been leaning into them for quite a few days. And yesterday was announced that there is a waiver on all permits about trees. But your, your issue goes deeper. And we will make sure that someone follows up with you. Um, regarding your specific case so we can understand it deeper than the three minutes allotted here. And thank you for coming, and I'll make sure that we have someone from my office and someone from Parks reach out to you. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you very much. And that completes communications. It does. To the consent agenda, please. Uh, I understand items 94, 98, and 99 have been pulled. Is that accurate? That's correct. Anything else? No. Please call the roll. 
Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Epps. Aye. Taylor. All right, the consent agenda is adopted to the first time certain item. Please, item number 90, a second reading. Amend the planning and zoning code to adopt temporary suspensions and permanent clarifications to development and process regulations as part of the housing regulatory relief project. Colleagues, this is a second reading. We have had presentations as well as public testimony on this item. Is there any further business on item 90? Keelan, please call the roll. Rubio. I want to start by thinking. I'm sorry, Commissioner Ryan had his hand up. Do you have your hand up? Oh, I just forgot to put it down. Okay, sorry, Commissioner. Go ahead. Um, I want to start by thanking everyone, uh, again, who filled out the survey early last year, which provided a launch point for this work. Um, I also want to thank the Planning Commission for their work reviewing this package. Council appointed, just appointed most of these commissioners last year after we completely restructured the commission and this was the first meaty policy that they've had to dive into and wrestle with. So I just want to again thank them for that work and for doing it on a very short timeline as we requested. And of course, everyone who provided testimony, we heard some feedback um, that we've gone too, a bit too far with this package and also that we haven't gone far enough, which is uh, usually uh, often a sign as policymakers juggling mo multiple priorities that we found a good balance in our approach. But mostly we've heard enthusiasm. Uh, for moving this work forward uh, because most people understand its importance. I also want to thank my colleagues who took the time to dive into this. It's really great to know that all five of us take this work very seriously and are supportive of moving this package forward. Um, I also want to appreciate, uh, Mayor, your skilled facilitation of, of the, the conversations at Council. Um, that was helpful in getting us through to where we need to be today. And finally, to the staff of um, Bureau and Planning, uh, Bureau of Planning and Sustainability, Donnie, Patricia, Sandra, and Phil, and others on the team. This wasn't initially on your work plan last year, but you rose to the challenge and provided thoughtful input and smooth shepherding of the process. Um, so as I've said before, this is an example of what we can do locally to boost housing production, um, and it's only just the beginning. So I'm very pleased to be voting aye. Ryan. Yes. Um, First of all, Commissioner Rubio, thank you for working on this for some time, um, for bringing more balance into your appointment, the appointments to the Planning Commission. Uh, I, w I found it refreshing to um, actually watch those meetings and see how they wrestled with this. And it was, it, was, it was because of that balance. And to hear one of the veterans on the commission say it was the first time they've had a split vote on an issue in the time they've been on mission says something about the fact that we're moving in the right direction to have what I call that creative tension in the room. And so it was no surprise then that we brought that here as well, because uh, we're the last chance to do that checks and balance. And so I, I, I didn't, pre one thing I didn't appreciate is the process um, arguments on this. I thought the process was fine. I thought the leadership from staff, looking out at uh, Sandra Wood and Phil Namini, I, I really enjoyed watching the way you handled those meetings. You were um, so knowledgeable on the fly. I was taken with that. I think the meeting was in this very setting. And I just was really pleased to see how balanced you were, how objective you were, how actual you were in your information. Uh, it, it, it was refreshing to see some objective uh, public service leadership in, in that space. It's a tough issue. We're, uh, we're constantly having the debates right now about building faster really taking this housing emergency seriously. And then we bring in folks and we listen to all of what they think is necessary to actually entice uh, builders. And we all are dealing with macro concerns that we don't have much control over. We don't get to control it, the, the rate of interest. We don't get to control supply chains. We don't get to control that. What we can't control are the policies and procedures here locally. And so we really came to a head with um, some, some of our environmental concerns that, that make us a lovely place to live and with the challenges that builders have been facing forever. It used to be builders would take that risk because Portland was a big investment. If you talk to anyone who does capital investments, you'll see that Portland's pretty much at the bottom of the list right now. We're not attracting capital investment right now. So it is our duty to provide some incentives that we're just probably not going to magically see um, a housing boom and building of homes. So I, I found it to be a very good debate, a debate that we need to continue to have. 
And so I will say that I'm impressed with where we're going on this. And I do think that we had a missed opportunity. I enjoyed the dialogue we had on the two amendments that Commissioner Gonzalez brought forward. It was a tough decision. I agonized over it for some time. And at the end of the day, when I talked to builders, they said those were the two that were making it the most difficult for them to pencil this out. So I chose to focus on housing, affordable housing, and, and that's why I support those amendments. Today, I am here to support this proposal because we did the work, we did our due diligence, we had our good debate on the amendments, and that's all on the record. I think we're gonna be here again as we continue to move through this. So thank you staff for holding that stance. And thank you, Commissioner Rubio, for bringing together a commission that actually allows us to have some of those debates at the commission level, and then we can continue to have them here. This is where we are, it's a housing crisis, and of course we care about the environment, and sometimes you have to make tough choices. Today, I'm all on board to support this work. I vote aye. Gonzalez. Uh, I want to echo uh, my colleagues' comments here. I, uh, I'm going to support this and vote aye today. Um, I do have deep concerns that it was uh, somewhat of a missed opportunity. We could have gone further. Uh, we didn't go far enough. Uh, and I think we're going to be back in the fall of confronting some of the many same issues. Uh, and at some level in the city of Portland, we're gonna to have to have the tough conversation. Are we truly, honestly committed to creating new supply in the region? Uh, and time and time again, whether at the city or at the state level, we haven't gone far enough. Uh, and that's uh, 40 years in the making, certainly exacerbated by high interest rates, uh, supply chain issues that Commissioner Ryan addressed, and the general perception of our region as an area to invest in. Uh, I will support the package. I appreciate the work of, of staff uh, and uh, my colleagues in a, a fairly rigorous conversation on the topic, but we need to do more and we got to do it faster. I vote aye. Maps. Aye. Wheeler. I want to thank uh, Commissioner Rubio again and the Bureaus of Planning and Sustainability, Development Services and Housing, as well as the Planning Commission to bring forward this regulatory relief package. I appreciate all the hard work and the creativity and the responsiveness to a wide variety of stakeholders in our community. To say that this was a complex project is a gross understatement. Although we, uh, as uh, other commissioners indicated, we still have a lot of work left to do to accelerate housing production. This set of regulatory relief measures provides what I believe are meaningful cost reductions, important administrative streamlining and time savings for housing projects in Portland. We continue to face a housing emergency in Portland and this package is just one further step that I think demonstrates the city's and the city council's seriousness in responding urgently as well as decisively to that crisis. Uh, moreover, in the near future, I'm looking forward to the governor's leadership and the state's legislature assisting the city with greater near-term housing production and development opportunities. I'm also looking forward to an upcoming city council work session alongside city bureaus as well as external stakeholders to adopt further key reforms locally that better attract capital to Portland and enhance our economic competitiveness. Compin continued progress and regulatory relief is, of course, critical to growing our affordable housing supply and to create more local jobs, as well as economic opportunities for all Portlanders. I am very happy to vote aye. The ordinance is adopted. Thank you, everybody. Next item, please, 91, also a second reading. Amend property tax exemption for multiple unit housing development code and inclusionary housing code to make technical corrections and adjust the property tax exemption for multiple unit housing developments. Before I call for the vote, any further discussion on this? Seeing none, Kaylin, please call the roll on the ordinance as it was amended. Rubio. As I shared earlier this month, the ordinance in front of us is the result of over 15 months of work making good on a commitment that city council made when the inclusionary housing program was first adopted to periodically review the program and compare incentives to program goals and market conditions. We did that work and came up with a proposal that is reasonable and targeted. These changes will make an already successful program even stronger, creating more affordable housing and, and more housing overall in some of the most amenity rich areas of our city. 
From what I understand, the Housing Bureau is already getting calls from folks interested in using these changes. It's no secret that we are, we are on the low end of the development cycle right now, but this ordinance and the zoning package that we just approved will help get projects across the finish line and move us up that bell curve sooner because Portlanders need these homes. Before this can go into effect on March 1st, we will need the county to adopt these changes as well. And I want to thank Chair Jessica Vega-Peterson for her partnership on this and look forward to having those conversations in the coming weeks. And as part of our own ongoing monitoring of the program, we'll do another calibration and review in a few years to see if additional adjustments are needed. And now some quick words of gratitude. I want to start by thanking the volunteers on the work group that PHB assembled in late 2022. I also want to thank the teams at the Housing Bureau who have been working on this for almost a year and a half. Jesse Connor, Antoinette Pietka, and Dory Heiler, who have all been advancing this work and at the staff level. Molly Rogers, who has since moved on to a new role at Washington County, but played a big part in shaping this work as, her, as interim director of PHB last year. And Michael Wanakor, who, who is current term as PHB director, um, is now for steering us across the finish line. Um, we have a new PHB director starting tomorrow, so you'll have to catch her up also on what she missed, Michael, if you're listening. Um, and of course, um, a big thank you to Commissioner Ryan for your leadership in getting the project going in 2022. And to our consultant team at BAE who did some excellent analysis so that we could bring forward a data-driven proposal. I also wanna thank my own staff, particularly Christina Gann, for diving into this project when the mayor assigned his portfolio to me early this last year. It's been a huge lift for all of us and I'm truly grateful for everyone's contributions. So with that, I vote aye. Ryan. Yes, um, thank you, Commissioner Rubio, for that mention. I actually will start off with saying recruiting that, that commission, that board, to look at the recalibration was quite an honor. And back to the point earlier about how important it is to have balanced perspective at the table. I recall in the recruitment, I got some pushback, quite a bit of push, pushback because we were leaning into that, that space. And what I see is the results of having that balanced perspective at the table. It's like hopefully all good policy where no one got everything they wanted, but together they met each other on their edges and we moved this forward in a way that will pencil out for more builders. And that was the case. We weren't seeing, that just happened. Um, we weren't seeing the returns that we wanted um, from this program. And so with all of the challenges that we have at this time, it was so important for us to get real and be a little bit more marketplace um, perspectives at the table uh, who actually do the building so these can pencil out and we can see more housing. So I'm pleased with the work, um, bravo, and I vote aye. Gonzalez. I vote aye. Maps. Aye. Mueller. Uh, again, I want to thank Commissioner Rubio and the Portland Housing Bureau for their work and uh, their very data-focused approach to producing more housing by rebalancing the multi-programs property tax incentive. It was thick, uh, the presentation, but I think ultimately they made a very strong case that they struck the right balance. I also want to appreciate the productive collaboration from the Multnomah County Chair and specifically uh, Multnomah County government in achieving agreement on this path forward. We've long heard about the financial challenges associated with inclusionary housing requirements in high cost areas of our city, that we cannot fully mitigate the recent national increases in construction costs or interest rates. This measure, I believe, helps to set to at least offset the costs associated with our lo local inclusionary housing policy so that we can facilitate construction of more homes for more Portlanders. Multi's expansion will make more multifamily housing projects financially feasible for developers in areas of the city that have some of the highest development capacity in our zoning code. Um, what I'm referring to, of course, is uh, in the midst of our ongoing housing emergency, this incentive is an important near-term as well as long-term strategy for getting dollars to be invested in our community for the purposes of creating housing. I vote aye, and the ordinance is adopted. Next time, certain item, please. Uh, item number 92. Consider appeal by the West Portland Park Neighborhood Association against the hearings officer's decision to approve with conditions a conditional use master plan and adjustment review for improvements to athletic facilities at Jackson Middle School, LU 22-185273, CUMS 80. 
This is a continuation of a land use appeal hearing on January 11th. That hearing, the council moved to tentatively deny the appeal and uphold the decision of the hearings officer with one additional condition. And we directed the applicants and staff to return with revised findings. Today, we're gonna to take a final vote. But before I entertain a motion, I'd like to ask the city attorney to briefly describe a minor change that staff made to our additional condition, just so that it is completely transparent on what we're voting to approve. So Lindley, I'll turn it over to you. Is uh, your mic on? Be red. There it is, yeah, there you It's go. new. Um, sorry, um, I just wanna highlight one minor change we made to conditional, which is the condition <laughs> that council added last week, which required the applicant to evaluate their conveyance pipe under the field and require the city to approve it. The condition identified BES as the bureau to approve that. It's not clear to staff whether it will be BES or another bureau, so we have simply changed the word BES and made it city. So I just wanna make sure before you vote, you're aware of that. So Mayor, handing it back to you. Great, any questions on that? So at this point, I'm asking for a motion to dispose to deny the appeal and uphold the decision of the hearings officer with one additional condition and adopt the findings. Can I get a motion? So moved. Commissioner Ryan moves. Can I get a second? Second. Commissioner Rubio seconds. Any further discussion? Please call the roll. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Yeah, just a couple things to say on this. I, I really appreciate the testimony of the hearing. We uh, had great balanced testimony from neighbors both in favor of um, this appeal to protect the natural areas in their neighborhood and from a lot of parents that um, also have written in before. It was about the fact that they just need more playing fields for their kids. Portland um, isn't at the place it should be in terms of the availability of playing fields for our, for our children. And we also have declining enrollment in our school districts. I'm really sensitive to that. School district data is usually a ahead of what we see from other demographics and where things are going. And we have to do everything we can to stop the, the enrollment declines in our schools, to cop, stop population decline in Portland in general. So I'm quite um, supportive of doing everything we can to continue to build those fields. And so I'm excited about this project. And I hope that all the neighbors that were there continue to hang out at that park and smile at each other and support one another as we move forward. How about I? Gonzalez. Um, I'm going to vote uh, aye on this. Uh, you know, this is an area that we are struggling as a community, our ability to retain and attract families. Uh, that's for complex reasons, uh, everything from tax burden to perception of the quality of public schools, but most certainly includes, do my children have a place to play? And uh, development of public school properties in particular are some of the most accessible uh, uh, recreation that many of our children in our city have. So it's essential that we do our part as a city to support that. Uh, and for that, I vote aye. Maps. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The motion to deny the appeal and adopt the findings passes. Thank you all. Colleagues, uh, I've had a request that we move one of the uh, pulled consent items to this portion of our agenda because we're going to lose a critical individual who can uh, help staff this. So I'm going to call item number 94 off the consent agenda here, please. Authorized grant agreement with Central City Concern not to exceed $2 million to support the purchase of property located at Southeast 16th Avenue and East Burnside Street for a residential alcohol and drug treatment facility. Colleagues, this item is an emergency ordinance that is an absolutely critical step in addressing the pressing need for more effective substance use disorder treatment options here in the city of Portland. Approving this item will reflect this council's commitment to the well being of our community, addressing a dire need of increasing public health resources, and fostering a healthier and safer community. To begin with, uh, we have a presentation by Skylar Brocker Knapp, a senior policy advisor in my office. And we are also lucky to have Dr. Andy Mendenhall, president and CEO of the Central City Concern here today. Uh, I look forward to your presentation, but before we get into this, may I ask who pulled it? Meg Robinson, a member of the public. Okay, why don't you come up and, and give your presentation? Um, 
I think it's good for us to all, all hear it anyway. So thanks for being here. And Andy, thank you for rearranging your schedule. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So on, sorry, okay, yes. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, could we pull the uh, presentation, please? Thank you. Uh, for the record, Skylar Barker Knapp, Senior Policy Advisor to Mayor Wheeler. Um, we're just going to go through a quick presentation of um, this center. It's critical, as the mayor mentioned, um, to the city um, and the region, frankly, um, increasing the number of residential treatment beds exponentially from what we currently have in the system. Um, we're really excited about the partnership between the city, state, county, um, and Care Oregon, as well as CCC, that who has... Um, champion this from day one. So we really appreciate their leadership on this. Yeah, we're pulling them up. Sorry. Thank you. Sorry for the delay. No worries. I'm just gonna go quickly through the funding mechanism for the city and then um, Dr. Mendenhall is gonna go through the actual program, what that building um, will look like and uh, who we will serve um, with that space. I'll give a preview maybe. So uh, 70 uh, residential treatment beds, thank you, um, will be a part of uh, this building, which is incredible. Um, Dr. Mendenhall will go through um, who they will serve based on the acuity level. Um, and I'm just gonna go through funding really quickly. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So um, $2 million of um, this purchase is coming from the city of Portland. Um, you see the other, um, amounts from different partners in the region. So the Oregon Health Authority at the state, Multnomah County, as well as uh, Central City Concern Funds. Um, please note that Care Oregon also provided some bridge loan funding uh, while these um, amounts were being finalized through the county and city processes. Um, so within the city of Portland, we are um, providing uh, $1,351,022 um, from the Beacon policy set aside. That is the remaining balance for the current fiscal year. You'll remember maybe that that um, set aside renews every fiscal year um, $1.9 million. So there will be a new policy set aside come July 1. Um, it also includes the remaining of the $2,648,978 from the opioid settlement funds. We get different amounts through different settlement agreements that happened over the course of many uh, settlement agreements with cities, counties, states um, throughout the nation. So um, we have more money coming in. Um, it'll be an 18-year process of receiving those funds. The state receives funds as well, so we all try to um, partner on kind of making the most efficient use of that money to really serve um, people in the best way. Um, all right, uh, next slide, please. Go for it. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of uh, the City Council, thanks for the opportunity to provide some very brief testimony for the record. My name is Andy Mendenhall, and I'm honored to serve uh, as the President and CEO of Central City Concern. Um, I'll just do a quick, quick highlight and state that the key here, uh, then Skyler mention this is partnership. As you saw, the funding, the braided funding approach represents alignment from city, county, state, and certainly support from Central City Concern. As I dive into the project details, I just want to say that we're really aiming to close a critical service gap for members of our community who suffer from dual diagnosis, and that means co-occurring substance use disorder with a mental health condition. Um, and the project is very exciting. Um, we certainly know that this is the Lolo Hotel. Um, this is an opportunity to repurpose the Lolo Hotel. Um, we're planning on about $1.75 million of tenant improvements, uh, which is very modest for a facility of this size. This is a very efficient project in terms of the number of beds coming online and the total aggregate cost uh, per bed. We'll be providing a secure residential substance use disorders program, three different levels of secure residential care. And by secure, I mean there's a locked door. Um, folks are there on their own volition, but folks do not leave the facility um, without permission and uh, either appear or they're escorted with, uh, with staff. And it's also a longer term length of stay, um, which we'll talk about in greater detail. This is a, an ideal location based on very close proximity to Hooper, to CODA, and CODA is a key partner in that they provide opioid 
They are a licensed and certified opioid treatment program that provides access to methadone in support of medication-assisted treatment for opioid use disorder. Um, the facility also has outdoor common areas uh, on the upper floor, and so uh, we strongly believe there'll be minimal overflow or minimal street presence of folks who are being uh, served by this facility um, to the surrounding neighborhood. Our plan is to go live by November 2024, so this is an opportunity uh, to move quickly. We're grateful for uh, the funding support from multiple stakeholders, and uh, we anticipate seeing our first patients, submitting our first patients in November, and then being fully operational with those 70 beds by April 2025. Next slide, please. This next slide, um, it really talks about, and some of you have seen this slide uh, published in media a couple of months ago. Um, this is a, a data slide that was produced by the Centers for Out the Providence Centers for Outcomes Research and Education in partnership with Care Oregon and HealthShare. Um, when we talk about dual diagnosis in our community, we're talking about the intersectionality of folks with uh, a psychosis diagnosis or a bipolar diagnosis, which is not demonstrated here, stimulant use disorder and opioid use disorder. And we can see there's a large number of individuals uh, who are Medicaid recipients of HealthShare who are adults who are struggling with these conditions. And these folks uh, uh, also, th this does not include uh, alcohol use disorder. We know that there are about 16,000 individuals with alcohol use disorder as well um, within the Medicaid cohort of HealthShare. Um, and these folks uh, deserve a level of treatment for the right level of service, the right duration that will allow those individuals to be successful. And we're not seeing a history of success with this patient population within our region, which is contributing to the challenges of street homelessness and, and livability in our community. We anticipate that we'll be serving between 200 and 240 clients per year because we know folks are gonna need more than just a 30-day spin dry, right? Um, that's a pejorative term I recognize, but that's also uh, a historical standard um, in the treatment industry that oftentimes is touted. These folks deserve months of treatment and stabilization, and we know that they have the opportunity to recover. Uh, we give folks the right level of service, they're gonna have that opportunity, and that's the vision for this program. Um, and that we're very excited about. Again, I'll just conclude on this slide. The focus is on populations not currently being served effectively by our regional continuum. And we'll go to the next slide. We're grateful for this opportunity and appreciate your support. We see this as an unprecedented win, a dem demonstrative of, of partnership between City County, the Oregon Health Authority, CARE Oregon, um, and Central City Concern. And most importantly, we know through our population health analytics this type of project will meet a population health need and close gaps for our city, for our community, and for our region. Thank you so much. Thank you. Colleagues, any questions? Do we have public testimony on this? That's my next question after I ask if anybody here has any questions. If there's public testimony, I'd like to hear that, and afterwards have I have testimony. questions. Uh, we do have one person signed up All online. Right. Can wait. Uh, so, well, is Meg Robinson here? And I, I see a gentleman in the back raising his hand. Who are these? Uh, these want to be patients in this building that they're going to. Are, are you signed up for public testimony? You dish. Yeah, my name is Johnny Cortez. Oh, sure. Is he on the list? You signed up for public like testimony today? Okay, well, I'm wasting more time arguing with you. Come on up. Uh, three minutes, name for the record, please. Thank you. And since we don't have you on the list, please state your name. Okay. Thank you. My name is Johnny Cortez Galindo. I was born at OHSU 1990, July 3. I emailed each and one of you. Please have a seat. Thank you. Um, I'm only raising awareness about no guns, weapons, or ammunition, or drinking alcohol, or smoking anything, or drugs, or no gang members. Gang members are probably being helped by a religious belief. I declared a state of emergency, and it's been uh, going on one year uh, in April. So I, is, is this testimony relevant to the presentation we just heard? Uh, well, actually, I was just only asking on this item. I was only asking where um, they were, these patients were going to come from, or okay. the building that they are going to um, use. Where they're coming from? Yeah. Okay. Well, we when when you're done, we'll have them come up and answer that question. Okay. Cool. They, yeah. Sure. Definitely. I'm actually going to ask a similar question. So okay. It, 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 we'll, we'll get covered right. uh, for them. Okay. Great. Um, yeah, other than that, I let the John Elder, I ran to his um, recruiting office and I'm um, enlisting to become a sergeant, at least, and just to walk around, ask questions about 
what these homeless are still doing in the streets. If they need uh, housing, I'm sure they, they can afford it. Um, they get some kind of income. I live at the Pro Studios. I'm employed at Safeway and Amazon DPD2. Uh, like I said, I've been here for um, one year already. Uh, and um, United States Air Force, National Guard also knows um, what I'm doing, the Marines and United States Marshals. So um, police department, city halls, uh, Gresham, Troutdale, uh, state government office, Tina Kotek at um, Salem. Um, they're aware also, they haven't returned my call or emailed, I'm sure, due to high, vo how high call volume. So um, it's, um, I'm really proud to actually just uh, say this to all of you here. Um, I do run, walk, and I pass my driver license test. It hasn't been issued to me, um, so I still have to look into that. Yeah, I'm 33, I'm single. It's been more than um, eight months already, so yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, appreciate, appreciate it. it. Thank you. Uh, uh, next in control, please. Next up, we have Susan Lindsay online. Hi, Susan. Hi there. I'm trying to figure this out here. You would think I would know how to use Zoom at this point, right? Um, hello, everybody. I'm Susan Lindsay. I'm the co chair of the Buckman Community Association, though I'm not representing the Buckman Community Association at this time. We did have a meeting right before an 80-foot tree fell on my house, which it still is sitting there, on January 11th, and about 80 to 85 people attended that meeting um, about this. Some of the concerns that we had, first of all, there was no neighborhood notification whatsoever. We only found out because there was a reporter <laughs> wandering around the neighborhood the day before. But this is two blocks from the elementary school it's not in the central city. It's in a residential area that uh, many people, the meeting said, have, has struggled to sort of recover from all of the uh, downturn of the pandemic, but it's really been coming back. And I, people uh, kind of to collectively say a lot of the sentiment that I heard at that meeting was people were very concerned of a couple of things. One, uh, this and then another project down at the Jolly Roger and other places that that again, that the residential area of Buckman, not in the central city, will become kind of the place where a lot of the problems from downtown will be uh, moved to. So uh, people are very concerned about the elementary school. Absolutely. It's two blocks away. And um, they are worried about impacts. Uh, they're concerned about whether there will be sex offenders at this facility. There is a, um, a midwifery uh, collective of, of, of midwives nearby that feel like that th this is not conducive to th their practice. There are several business owners that are concerned about it. So we just, I mean, I'm just saying this because at the same time, uh, Buckman is a very uplifting, positive neighborhood uh, and wants to be a part of the solution to the the devastation that Portland's been going through for years that all of us have witnessed. And, um, and, and yet we want to support from the city and the county and the state who are all involved in, in this massive amount of public funds to buy this, this new building. We want support uh, and, and inclusion. I mean, I've heard lots of things of all the people that are being included in this coming together with this emergency ordinance and spending of a lot, a lot of public money. But there's really no mention of any of the neighbors that are there. So we just want to be included. We had uh, Mayor Wheeler, we had your representative, Hank, came to the meeting, and he was great. We want uh, the city and the county to be involved and to help us continue to work with Central City Concern in a positive way to make sure that the neighborhood can be assured that we will be protected uh, from the impacts of this facility. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Susan, if I could just respond to that. First of all, uh, I really appreciate your being here. And uh, frankly, I was sort of glad we had an excuse to hear the presentation. Uh, your concerns are completely valid. I, I want to say that just point blank. And uh, you can't see her, but Skylar Brocker Knapp is in the room here. And she, she is nodding as you were speaking in agreement that those are issues that we will absolutely have to make sure we stay on top of. Um, so. Uh, please know that, that, that we are sensitive to what you're saying. We appreciate it. 
And thank you also for saying nice things about Hank Smith. I'll pass that along to him. He's got a tough job in my office. And uh, we think we think he does a pretty great job. So I'll pass that along. And I really appreciate your saying. No, I mean, I just want to add, Mayor Wheeler, yeah, we've, been, we've really appreciated the, the city's efforts in the Central East Side and, and beyond with with the, the impacts we're having from this addiction crisis and homelessness crisis. But we're people are scared. People are scared that this facility, yeah. if it's not well run, will mean that people will be leaving. And we, we don't want to. We want to keep we want to keep our neighbors. Yeah, and, and uh, that's totally understandable, and I understand why people would would be anxious about this. I totally get it. Thank you. Anybody else? Commissioner Maps, did you have a... Uh, Commissioner, I'll let Commissioner... I did have a couple of quick questions yeah, that I wanted to... to... And, and also, if you want to, uh, after Commissioner Gonzalez, talk about some of the measures you're going to take to ensure that... that the surrounding communities not negatively impacted. Commissioner, I, absolutely, you can start with that. I think okay. that would be a great. I'd, yeah. Sure thing. Um, I've I've forgotten Susan's last name. I apologize, but um, I really thank you. I, I really appreciate um, her bringing this forward and the members of the Buckman Community Association as well. Central City Concerns proud to operate. Uh, we have 51 different programs in, in and buildings across um, Multnomah County and a couple programs down in Clackamas County. A relationship, a good relationship, um, and the development of good neighborhood agreements is um, something that's part of our history and something we're absolutely committed to. Um, I will say that, that um, in this moment, um, secure residential facilities have a much uh, different footprint, a much more positive footprint than um, some types of housing programs. So it's very easy for folks to um, potentially confuse one with the other. Um, and I do want to make sure that that's, uh, for the record, something that we're absolutely committed to in terms of understanding then um, a lens to the clients that are being served. And what, what the mitigation strategy looks like for that is something that we're committed to in terms of ongoing conversation. Can I... If you lived in the neighborhood and wanted to be at the table as you have that conversation, how's that going to happen? Commissioner, we have um, members from our team that come out and actively engage neighborhood associations. That's part of our activation, notification and activation strategy. Um, I will, again, state for the record, this opportunity came at a very, very short timeline, much, much shorter than... Um, we traditionally um, have operated, so I want to say that for the record as well. And, and we also know that this was a very unique opportunity, recognizing we'd been looking for a facility that could potentially support this type of service uh, for over a year uh, within the Tri-Counties region. And, um, and this property proved itself to be quite ideal. And I'll just mention um, as well, Commissioner, um, Hank Smith is like actively involved with uh, the CCC team and the problem solver meetings are also a great way for folks to just get connected um, who are already kind of engaged, but may not be engaged with the neighborhood association, but are obviously engaged um, in kind of issues around the community. So those, those will be different avenues and we're happy to um, connect folks to CCC or their team. And we're working closely with them to support this good neighbor agreement. So there is a good neighbor agreement. There will be. <laughs> so that was kind of the first meeting of uh, that they hosted and that Hank attended that Susan mentioned. I'll have some more, but I'll uh, see some other hands around. Yeah, Commissioner Gonzalez. So uh, first of all, doctor, I want to thank you for your uh, uh, efforts on the Buford Norphine pilot that we're rolling out with Portland Fire and CCC. Um, really looking forward to that collaboration. Um, excited about this as well. Can and I just want to build off one aspect of the last uh, area of inquiry. You know, we have seen at times some of the, uh, and I'm going to use the term treatment center very broadly here, um, behaviors occurring out in the immediate vicinity of various types of uh, treatment centers that are not conducive to the patients inside the uh, center and not conducive to the neighborhood. And um, frankly, you know, we see people preying on many people trying to get treatment inside and creating behaviors that are detrimental to the neighborhoods. And I guess one of my questions is, it looks like do we have to create the space to sort of work out what the good neighbor agreement would look like, which that I fully grasp and understand. What more can the city 
be doing and what should what else should we be thinking about in terms of protecting the space around treatment facilities that drives away sort of sort of the predatory behaviors that comes and i'm going to be crystal clear for those who are listening at home we have people that are trying to get clean and we have drug dealers sometimes targeting those facilities x amount of feet from that facility and it is um kind of the most treacherous behavior imaginable um and yet it happens uh, in, in our community and I, I guess I'm just sort of curious if you have thoughts on what we can do to protect the space, both for neighbors and for the patients that are trying to recover. It's a great question, Commissioner. I'd like to start and talk a little bit about, um, if I could, the difference between a secure residential treatment facility and then what we would refer to as an ambulatory or an outpatient facility. So a, a secure residential facility um, and, and you know, we oper operate one and have operated one um, since the mid 1980s um, in a neighborhood that um, uh, folks really don't even know that it's there because the doors are locked um, and it's a place for women and children um, frequently who have uh, domestic violence history. So um, we uh, do our best to protect the, both the, the the name and the location of that that particular facility, um, for those reasons, because folks come looking, if you will, but that's extremely extremely rare. Um, so the the reality of a residential treatment program is that there's not a lot of that type of activity going on outside. Now, if we're talking about an ambulatory program where people are coming and going, and that can be of of higher volume for some types of ambulatory program. It can be much lower volume. Um, people are coming and going, and folks are at various stages of recovery. Environments like that absolutely, absolutely can have an impact on sidewalks, can have an impact on the broader community. To answer your question directly, um, partnership in terms of um, presence of law enforcement, um, partnership in terms of recognizing that we don't yet have enough shelter um, in our communities, and so sometimes folks will camp out outside of a program. Um, we certainly don't see that, um, nor, nor would that be um, appropriate for a secure residential program because that's not where folks are going to be coming into. They're not going to be stepping in off the street. They're going to be coming through a place like the Hooper Center. They're going to be coming through a place like Unity. Um, and they will have received some stabilizing medical and psychiatric care before arriving at a facility like that. Um, I'll come back to your, the, the final point. Is there an opportunity for greater uh, presence and engagement with public safety partners in um, higher volume environments where there is that predatory aspect unequivocally? Got it. No, that's super helpful. And you kind of answered my second question, just the referral mechanism um, into the program. What is exit? a successful exit from the program look like? Great question. A successful exit looks like graduation from the program, transition to what we do at Central City Concern and many other service providers uh, in our community provide, which is access to supportive recovery housing or a sober living type of environment with a step down to outpatient substance use disorder service and ongoing care. Got it. Got it. So appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, for now. Great. Uh, Commissioner Ryan? Yes. <clears throat> First of all, Dr. Mendenhall, thank you for being here today. I realize it probably wasn't on your schedule until late last night. Okay. It's great to see you. And of course, I think all of us have our hands up because we love to connect with you and, and your brain has a lot of information. I've been in a lot of meetings with you and I want to just acknowledge how much I appreciate you lifting the truth. This is really complex. It's a complex problem. It takes complex solutions something in the political sector that we have trouble with sometimes. So I really appreciate that you take time to explain the severity of this challenge that we're in. Thank you. <clears throat> you said something really big, and that is um, we don't have anything quite like this right now anywhere. Very few. Okay. And so it's a missing part of a system. Do you see this as a component of a system that we're building? This is an absolutely essential part of a system that we're building. I do want to honor and acknowledge uh, for healthcare, for healthcare's program has um, this type of treatment um, service that's being offered, and um, they're doing a beautiful job with it. We just know that we need to do more. Okay, and Commissioner Gonzalez uh, asked the question I wanted to talk about, which is why I wanted to hear it's part of a system, and where will people go after this? 
do you think that there's also people that are currently in some of the supportive housing units that have services, but not 24 seven, not as a secure location, could also be placed in this facility? Unequivocally, we do have people that are not, uh, they are not as successful as we'd like them to be. We've seen an erosion in performance. Um, let me rephrase that. We've seen an erosion of the positive impact on folks at Central City Concern. That's been published as well. We've seen a reduction of about 20 to 25% of folks who used to step in from Hooper, still do step in from Hooper, um, exiting successfully. Those numbers used to be about 70% pre-pandemic and before fentanyl and this new methamphetamine arrived. And now we're, we're seeing exit positive exits of our supportive recovery housing program of about 45 to 48%. So there's been a marked reduction Dramatic over a period. Drop. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's nearly one in four people. And that's, I think, where a lot of us policymakers <clears throat> have been slow to just accept the truth, which is in 2020, new drugs hit the marketplace, very accessible, very cheap, and they really changed the dynamic of this conversation. And so I always, I've been in meetings where I think it's been hard for people to accept the truth about that and that all of us can therefore have some clarity about what the problem is. So keep that up. Um, I'm happy to hear that you're in conversations with the neighbors. I think they always just want to know about the buffer zone, have a little bit of experience in, in this when we're opening up the villages. And I, I appreciate that you know that's very important. And what I always would say in those Zoom meetings with like 400 people saying colorful things on the chat was that it's really also for, it's really for those who are inside the villages, inside these units, they need that buffer zone to the point that Commissioner Gonzalez made, which is they're just so triggered when they um, just step outside. And then of course, they're going to be triggered by someone wanting them to hang out and continue to do the drug that they're trying to withdraw from. So those are this is the real crisis that we're in. This seems like the right solution. And I look forward to hearing about how the negotiations go with the community. And I know that the buffer zone will be a big part of it. And I'm looking forward to supporting this. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Rubio. Thank you. Um, thank you, Doctor, for being here. Um, I, I want to echo that I am very excited about this project. Um, I do have a quick, uh, a few couple of questions based on uh, testimony we heard today. Um, so I understand that uh, the Good Neighbor Agreement is going to be developed. Um, can you give examples? And you've talked about how you have similar agreements um, or similar understandings with other, in, in other locations that you're already in. Can you talk a little bit about um, some of the agreements that you feel are good examples so that we can understand how you work with community in, in a functional, high functioning agreement? Absolutely. I'm going to probably fail to name the neighborhoods and I'm just gonna give you that, uh, that, that in advance and I apologize. And I apologize to the neighborhoods uh, impacted by that. Um, um, it's a great question. We've worked very, very actively with our community partners in the neighborhood that our Blackburn Center um, is cited, and that's at 122nd and Burnside. Um, the name might float into my frontal lobe, and I apologize again in advance. Um, uh, and uh, that's been a, an ongoing process over the last uh, four and a half to five years. We do know um, that we've had periods of time when the Blackburn um, Center, and in particular, um, there's been a, a focus, is it the Blackburn Center, is it the Safe Rest Village, is it just the confluence of, of you know, multiple factors in that part of the city? Um, what we know is that we've been successfully navigating that relationship with a lot of time, effort, and energy, and partnership. That's the key part of the equation. Partnership um, with the city, partnership with other community uh, members, businesses within the region. Um, I would highlight that as an area we've put a lot of time and energy in and also recognize that um, that large housing and ambulatory program is very different than a secure residential treatment program, has a different set of challenges in terms of community impact. Great. And so what I'm hearing then is there's continuous and ongoing engagement despite, so it's, it's a, a live partnership um, as it were. Okay, so that's this, correct, Commissioner. Okay, so yes. we can anticipate that this is not kind of a one and done kind of situation where you, you do the good neighbor agreement, you have a few months of engagement, and then that's it until a problem happens. This is continuous relationship over years. We're absolutely committed to that. That's been our track record. That's great to hear. Yes, thank you. Commissioner Maps. Um, I want to thank, uh, thank you for the presentation today. And I want to say, especially at a policy level, uh, I'm 
very excited to see this project happen. This is clearly a missing piece in Portland's uh, social service um, net. Um, and I also want to say I'm a neighbor. I live about four blocks from here. I go by Lolo Pass literally several times a day. Um, and um, I want to thank Susan for pulling this. Um, I think Susan did a great job of kind of capturing where the neighborhood's at. Um, you know, Buckman is um, a kind, caring, engaged, progressive neighborhood that wants to be part of um, the solution. Um, at the same time, you know, I got to tell you, people are kind of concerned uh, um, here. I, the engagement and outreach has not been great. You know, I find myself being kind of the neighborhood educator about what's happening here. And frankly, I have not been, I sit on council and I have not been briefed even up to this moment. Um, and that's a problem. I realize this is moving fast and this is a unique opportunity um, at the same time. But uh, we haven't had a great launch, at least on the public en engagement piece. Um, and the other thing I'd, I'd have to say, a lot of people who live in Buckman literally live in Buckman because you got the elementary school there. Like a lot of folks kind of moved to be adjacent to that. So it's a neighborhood of young families. Um, my kids went to Buckman. Um, my friends who are in the neighborhood tend to have kind of young kids. They wander around. My kids uh, pass by, by this facility on their own um, every day. Um, and um, I'm concerned, even in the current conditions here on the streets, you know, it makes me scared to send my kids out, and they have reason to be scared. Bad things happen and have happened. Um, I know that if we're going to turn Portland around, we need to have facilities like this um, that help people heal and move on. Um, at the same time, in order, I think, to um, settle people uh, um, down, we need to have uh, better engagement, better communication, um, I also want you to know, I know deep in my heart that actually if you engage with the Buckland neighborhood, they're going to be allies and um, allies for you. They're going to want to make this work. And I'll also tell you, you know, I don't know. A year, I don't know if I'm going to be on this council a year from now. I don't know if I'm going to be on this council five years from now. I don't know if I'm going to be on this council nine years from now. But I do know I am going to be in my house until I die. And I expect to be buried across the street in Lone Fir Cemetery. So you and I um, are in this to, to the end. Um, I'll tell you um, whether or not I'm on this council or not, I'm going to engage with you. <laughs> in order to make this particular facility work, uh, um, because this is my neighborhood, um, and um, I love my neighborhood. They kind of got me here where I am, and they kind of inspired me to kind of do the work that I do. Um, but, you know, this is the beginning of a long uh, 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 and beautiful friendship, um, I hope. Um, and I, I think I, I pledge my friendship and partnership in here. I'm going to need you um, to pledge your friendship and partnership as we move through this. And this is not, you know, I, I noticed Skylar's kind of written into this contract. I don't know where she's going to be here in a year from now. Um, but I cannot quit on this one. Right. Uh, um, you know, I hope my kids inherit my house because that's probably the only way they can afford a house there. So this is sort of um, as fundamental as it possibly could be for me. And it's as fundamental as it can possibly be for my neighbors. Um, and actually providing the services that you're about to provide is, you know, fundamental to making Portland a better place. But it's going to require partnership and we need to be good neighbors. I'm going to vote for this. But I also want you to know this is hard. This is one of the reasons why it's hard to be a Portlander, you know. Um, but sometimes you got to be brave. You got to be tough. You got to address the issues that are before you. And I think all of this does this. But colleagues, you know, even as I vote for this, I will tell you this is not easy for me. Like my life and my kid's life and my neighbor's life are going to be kind of different moving forward. I hope it's going to be better, um, and we will do everything that we can to make this better. But, you know, this is one of the, as I take this vote, uh, you know, I am reminded of uh, some of the challenges that um, Portland asks of all of us. Um, and this is what good citizenship looks like. Um, <coughs> I'm proud of what we're about to do here. Um, but I also have a little bit of a heavy heart. You know, I know that there will be some rough days ahead. So that's all I got. Thank you. Uh, yep. Commissioner Gonzalez. I, I have just one last set of 
questions and then comments and somewhat triggered by Commissioner Maps' line. Um, you know, like he, I, I've lived on the east side since 2002. Um, my children went to school a little bit east of his uh, at a Portland public school, had a residential treatment uh, facility in, uh, in the neighborhood. Um, my children went to school with children that were living in that facility. Uh, I had no idea. So it's, it's in only, I only knew about it years later because my wife was a social worker and she mentioned that it was very deliberately placed there to uh, allow a more natural transition for the children. Um, and uh, I think that's success story. That's a success story for residential treatment uh, facilities. Again, I'm broadly using that term here just, uh, but, uh, and so it can be successful in, 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 in neighborhoods. Uh, I have also, in my role as public safety commissioner, seen the really ugly other side of, as you refer to the ambulatory uh, services, and when that goes amok, and uh, how devastating that can be for neighborhoods on the bad days, and how devastating it could be it can be for the people that we're trying to treat on its bad days. And uh, Blackburn's had I, I, I saw it on a bad day, <laughs> just to be clear, and. Mm -hmm. Um, it, 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 I don't think it was just Blackburn. I think it was a lot of the dynamics going on in that particular neighborhood. Uh, but it, we, this is serious stuff, and uh, it's an ongoing issue. So I just, as the observation, and for those listening at home and for those in the Buckman neighborhood, I have seen this successful, and it was successful because you didn't even really know, right? It was, it was, it was integrated into the neighborhood, low impact. But my, my. So that all leads to really a question. What is the rest of the state doing in providing residential beds? Because I'm getting to the point as a Portlander and as an advocate for the city that on the one hand, we have to do our share. But my God, so does the rest of the state in this area. And you know, we suffer from in the city of Portland at times from a failed behavioral health system at the state level. I mean, it's, it is a state failure, 40 years in the making, that plays it itself out every day on the streets of Portland. And um, so I guess that's just my, you know, general question. It almost borders on a NIMBY question. Uh, I think I'm asking more than that. I think we're, you know, we're doing our share as the city of Portland. Our communities are doing its share, but what is the rest of the state doing in this area right now? Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I'd love to start with some amplification, pivot to the state, and then close with a commitment to Commissioner Maps, if, if that'd be okay. Just to and could I ask you to be as succinct as possible? Yes, us. Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Um, we anticipate a, a great success, and and what a secure residential treatment facility looks like and should feel like is that you barely know that it's there. There are dozens around the Portland metropolitan area. And um, I'll get to the commitment. I'm committed to friendship, partnership, and accountability, both personally as well as my team commissioner. Um, with respect to the state, um, I, it, I'm, I'm aware that we're likely to receive um, at some point in the near future uh, from uh, leadership at the OHA and accounting of um, what type of inventory regarding different types of residential facilities will be coming online. That, that timeline is a little bit unclear to me. Um, I completely agree with you, uh, Commissioner Gonzalez, that we have an issue that we have identified in our population health data, and that has led to a series of behavioral health recommendations that have been advanced through the Portland Central City Task Force, um, specific to the needs of secure residential treatment and other forms of residential treatment within the region. Um, I, will, I will note that um, the growth plan for the Portland area has been uh, very deficient in terms of closing that gap. And so we feel that um, this 70 bed addition is a really critical, is really critical for us at this time. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Ryan. I'll be brief. So the good neighbor agreements, I've been involved in these. And the one through line that I kept seeing was the culture of some of the provider network, mostly through the county. There wasn't always um, adherence to the fact that the 
provider needs to really be a part of that good neighbor agreement. And they have to place the phone calls to now the very capable SSCC team that we acknowledged earlier. And uh, if you can get that as a part of their daily routine, their hourly routine, the front desk, and then have support around them, then it really does work. And I know with our contracts through the county at the villages, we really had to keep emphasizing that point. So the good neighbor agreement doesn't really work unless it's implemented. And it really does start with the good neighbor of the provider. I trust that you know that. I trust that with this facility, especially with this audience, that this will be stepped up. And so we can start to turn the corner and build some trust when we put in facilities. Absolutely, Commissioner. We're absolutely committed to that. And we were excited to have members of CCC staff um, rush to the opportunity to meet with the Buckman Community Association, uh, Neighborhood Association, pardon me, um, the first time that it was it was offered, and we're going to continue to do that. Great. Thank you for that. And I'll be sure I get on your mailing list. Great. Good discussion. Thank you, everybody. Please call the roll. Yeah. Um, as I mentioned, I'm really hopeful for this opportunity, and we know we need more treatment capacity like what's planned here. Um, I also want to say that I understand the concerns shared in testimony by uh, Ms. Lindsay and also Commissioner Maps, um, and I support the suggestions that uh, she made about including neighbors more, um, you know, more intentionally around the plans to ensure safety and security. Um, it's also good to know, uh, personally for me, the distinctions between the closed residential and the treatment facility, or closed residential and then the ambulatory facility, um, and that CCC will be a full and constant partner. That matters a lot, um, and I will be watching to ensure that this, this is commitment is kept. Um, the unfortunate reality is because of our needs, um, we'll continue to need facilities like this until we uh, make progress um, on our goals to end these challenges, but it requires vigilance from the city and the provider and the community um, doing their part to work with community to ensure success and safety for everyone. So I want to thank you uh, for your willingness to take this on, um, and also I want to thank uh, the mayor's team for bringing this forward. I vote aye. Aye. Yes, uh, Dr. Mendenhall, I appreciated our dialogue and the candid dialogue you had with all my colleagues. That's what really mattered. I vote aye. Gonzalez. Vote aye. Maps. Um, I'm excited about this project. I tell you, treatment beds are one of the um, just crucial gaps that we have in our social service system. Um, and we all need to come together to uh, bring facilities like this online. Um, in order for facilities like this to work, as I think our dialogue illustrated, we have to have partnerships between the providers and the community. I am a member of this community and I will be a member of this community for the remainder of my life, and this building's going to be there for an awful long time. So I look forward to um, our long engagement in making uh, this particular project succeed. I want to thank you for being here today. I, um, I think this one might have gotten pulled off consent. Uh, um, so uh, you, great testimony, great conversations. Uh, I look forward to many more, um, and for these reasons more, I vote aye. Wheeler. Very happy to support this. I vote aye. The ordinance is adopted. Thank you both. Thanks, colleagues. Uh, colleagues, we're going to take a break in a minute, but we have to get through item 100 first. And so uh, please read item 100, which is resolution and appointments. Appoint Jesse Ledesma to the Home Forward Board of Commissioners for a term to expire January 9th, 2028. Commissioner Rubio. Thank you, Mayor. Colleagues, as you all know, Home Forward is our local housing authority. And as a public entity, they own and operate over 6,000 units of low-income housing and are responsible for administering a variety of related programs for our region, including thousands of federal housing vouchers. Portland City Council is responsible for final approval of all seats on Home uh, Forward's Board of Commissioners. However, there is one seat that we are responsible for nominating to specifically represent Portland's interests on the board. Today, we are considering a candidate for that seat, Jesse Ledesma. Ms. Ledesma has experience in both affordable and moderate income housing development and previously served on an advisory committee for the Portland Housing Bureau. I'm pleased to be nominating her for the Home Forward Board of Commissioners and believe she will greatly contribute to the board's deliberation. Um, and I would like, now like to welcome Ivory Matthews, the executive director of Home Forward, and to, in, to introduce Jesse today. Ivory is an incredibly accomplished and capable leader who is about to celebrate two years in her role at 
Home Forward's helm. And it's a big job, and I'm so grateful for her work, and she's made a tremendous influence in our community in these two short years. So I want to thank her um, and Justin for joining us today, and also appreciate that you waited um, that you waited to get to this point. So appreciate your patience there. So congratulations, Ivory, on your two years, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Wheeler, um, Commissioner Rubio, and also members of uh, council. Um, again, I'm Ivory Matthews, the CEO for Home Forward. I'm super excited that um, I'm about to celebrate my two-year anniversary, so I'm officially a Portlander uh, and uh, an Oregonian now, so super excited. Uh, I am also um, excited to be introducing uh, Jesse Ledesma for your consideration and appointment. Uh, Jesse Ledesma is the founder and principal of Homework Development and co-developer of Short Stack Housing. Jesse founded Homework Development in early 2021 with a vision to build a new model for inclusive and responsive housing development. Prior to Homework, Jesse was Director of Development at Beam Development and previously developed affordable housing for both for-profit ownership and non-profit ownership. Jesse has transacted over 200 million in development volume across 18 projects. This includes over 600 affordable housing units and 200,000 square feet of commercial development space. I feel like Jesse will be just an extremely uh, beneficial uh, component to the Home Forward Board, and uh, I appreciate you uh, considering her for your appointment today. Very good. Jesse, did you want to say anything? You don't have to. Good afternoon. Thank you, Ivory, for that introduction. Jesse Ledesma, as Ivory mentioned, I'm the founder of Homework Development and the co-founder of Short Stack Housing. I've been a developer in the Portland area for 17 years with a focus now on developing missing middle attainable housing. And I'm honored to be nominated for this appointment uh, to Home Forward, you know, the most, one of the most, if not the most productive affordable housing developers and social service providers in our community. And I would be thrilled to offer my expertise and experience in this role, but likewise learn from Ivory and her uh, very experienced staff to collectively meet our affordable housing goals and to further the affordable housing production uh, for Portland. Thank you. We really appreciate your being here and stepping forward. Do we have public testimony on this item? <clears throat> no one signed up. Any further questions, colleagues? This is a resolution to make the appointment. Please call the roll. Rubio. Um, thank you so much, Jesse, for your interest in serving, and I can't wait to see your influence on the on the board. I'm very pleased to vote aye. Ryan. First, Ivory, it's good to see you. I can't believe it's been two years. I think I was lucky enough to meet you um, on Zoom when you first arrived, so I'm glad you hung in there, and you sound like the perfect fit for this board, Jesse, so thanks for stepping up. I vote aye. Gonzalez. Thank you, Jesse, for your service. I vote aye. Absolutely. Uh, Jesse, again, thank you uh, for being here today. Thank you for agreeing to uh, and serve on this important board. Um, I vote aye. Wheeler. Well, Jesse is a perfect candidate for this board. You have innovative and practical experience in affordable housing development, something obviously we desperately need in our community. Ivory, thank you as well for the presentation. Uh, and Jesse, I just want to thank you for the incredible amount of work that you're going to do on behalf of the community. Sorry we don't pay you better, uh, but we really appreciate you and appreciate your public service. I'm happy to vote aye, and the resolution is adopted. The appointment's approved. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So uh, the much-anticipated break is upon us. It is now about 1140. We will reconvene at 1150. Until then, we are in recess.
on okay let's reconvene people uh item number 101 from the regular agenda this is a report except a bid of one million eight hundred and forty six thousand seven hundred and twenty eight dollars from inter lichen incorporated for the southeast 174th sidewalk infill from southeast start to southeast main project colleagues this report authorizes the portland bureau of transportation to execute a contract that will improve street conditions by reducing barriers and hazards for pedestrians as well as bicyclists. And I believe we have Biko Taylor. Yes, there's Director Taylor online to present the item. Welcome. Morning, Mayor Wheeler. Can you hear me clearly? Yep, loud and clear, and we can see you too. Thank you. Good morning to the members of City Council as well. For the record, my name is Biko Taylor. I am the Chief Procurement Officer on September 6, 2023, Council approved Ordinance 191436 for this project. The engineering estimate for the project was $1,875,278, and the confidence level was deemed low to moderate at that time. On December 7, 2023, Procurement Services in issued an invitation to bid. Uh, I'm sorry, we, we uh, published that invitation to bid on November 16, 2023. The due date was December 7, 2023. In total, Procurement Services received six bids on the project. Interlaking Incorporated is the low bidder and is the recommended awardee. Their bid totals $1,846,728, which is 1.5% below the engineering estimate. The city standard 20% aspirational goals apply to this project. And I'll give you a brief summary of that performance. Interlaking Incorporated, which is the low bidder, will perform 62% of the contract. 32.8% of this contract will be performed by certified COVID subcontractors. So Interlaken did a really good job of attaining COVID participation on this project on behalf of PBOT. A few facts about Interlaken. They're located in Fairview, Oregon. They are a state WBE COVID certified contractor. They do hold a current city of Portland business tax registration and are in full compliance with all of the city's contracting requirements. Requirements. If there are any questions about the procurement process, I'm happy to answer those questions now. If you have any more specific questions regarding the project, I do have a colleague from PBOT, um, Abra McNair, is in attendance as well. This will conclude my presentation. Very well done, sir. Uh, do we have any questions at this juncture? Any public testimony on this item, Keelan? No one's saying. Call the roll. Uh, Mayor, did you? I'm know? sorry. Uh, this is a report. I'll entertain a motion to so accept moved. the report. Commissioner Maps moves. Can I get a second? second? Commissioner Gonzalez seconds. Any further discussion? Now we can call the roll. Rubio. Happy to vote aye. Ryan. Hello, Biko. Good to see you again. I'm really pleased to see the 33% COVID subcontracting number, and I accept the report. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Wheeler. 
Aye. The report is accepted. Thank you, Director Taylor. Item 102, also a report. Accept the Portland Police Bureau report to City Council on the 2024 Portland Joint Terrorism Task Force. I will turn this over to Sergeant Mark Friedman at the Portland Police Bureau to introduce the item. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning, Mayor Wheeler. Good morning, City Commissioners. My name is Mark Friedman, uh, and I am a sergeant with the Portland Police Bureau, where I'm currently assigned to supervise the officers and professional staff assigned to the Criminal Intelligence Unit. City Council Resolution 37 424 requires the Police Bureau to report to City Council by the end of January every year, a summary of the frequency of which the FBI Special Agent in Charge requested the assignment of Portland Police Bureau CIU officers for an investigation, the number of cases that were referred to the PPB by the FBI, the number of cases that were referred to the FBI by the PPB, the nature of the closed cases referred to the PPB by the FBI, including the demographics of the persons involved and the disposition of those cases. The report also details our compliance with the requirement that members of CIU receive annual refresher training from the city attorney's office to ensure compliance with all state and federal laws. You can see in the report that our annual training was completed this year by the city attorney's office on January 16th. Additionally, the city's attorney's office has advised us that there are no state federal law changes that impact or preclude the ability of PPB members to work with the members of the JTTF when requested. Moving forward, uh, I'll summarize the key information contained in the report. In 2023, the FBI special agent in charge requested the assignment of PPB CIU officers for the assistance with criminal investigations three times, covering a total of three cases. These cases all remain open investigations and all referred cases followed the procedure outlined in Portland Police Bureau Directive 750, which in which the special agent in charge of the FBI made a request to then Chief Lavelle for investigative assistance of PPB CIU officers. The Portland, uh, the Portland JTTF did not request, uh, did not refer any cases to Portland Police Bureau CIU for review and investigative assistance in 2023. In 2023, PPB CIU referred one case to the FBI JTTF for review and possible follow-up investigation. The nature of that case involved an individual who was making a threat of targeted violence via social media, which was reported to the police bureau by a person residing in the city of Portland. And that individual was identified as a white male adult. Since CIU did not have any referred cases from the FBI and uh, JTTF in 2023, there are no specific case details to provide to council for last year. However, uh, in January of last year, when we when we reported out uh, details, there were we were we were only able to report out um, three of ten total cases referred to PPB by uh, the JTTF. We committed to tracking those cases and reporting out the specific information to you at the time of this report, and those are provided in the 2024 report in front of you, uh, Mr. Mayor and Councilors. I want to respect your time. I'm happy to summarize those six <coughs> cases if you like. Um, you may have already reviewed them, and I'm happy to defer on that as well. Very good. Uh, they're in the report. I, does anybody want a further review? Very good. Any questions, colleagues? Do we have public testimony on this matter? We do have people signed up. All right. I'll let you take it from here. Thank you, Mayor. First up, we have uh, Jude Alcazel Stone online. Good morning. Morning, Commissioners. My name is Jude Alcazel Stone. I'm testifying on behalf of the American Civil Liberties Union. And as we've testified before, the ACLU of Oregon has several concerns about the JTTF's collaboration with the Portland Police Bureau. But today I want to especially focus on the role of ORS 181A-250. Oregonians who have long valued government transparency and police oversight first passed this statute in the 80s. An ORS 181A-250 prohibits law enforcement from collecting or maintaining information that contains uh, about people's political, religious, or social views or associations um, without reasonable suspicion of criminal activity. And a huge motivator for passing this law in the first place was that the Portland Tribune revealed that for the past 20 years, the PPB had engaged in widespread surveillance of over 3,000 individual and groups without reasonable suspicion of criminal activity. 
Thankfully, Oregon demanded better, and the statute now holds our law enforcement agencies to a higher standard than many other jurisdictions do, including the federal government. So in other words, the PPB must comply with ORS 181A250, but the FBI does not. And that's a fundamental piece of our concern with the JTTF partnership. Since only a select few officers have security clearance to participate in JTTF cases, there's no outside oversight ensuring that PPB officers are not violating the statute when collaborating with FBI colleagues who have different standards. And what's even more distressing is PPB's own spotty record of complying with 181A250 in recent years. So this wasn't just in the 80s. The ACLU of Oregon successfully sued the PPB in 2020 for violating the statute when they live streamed Black Lives Matter protesters who were participating in lawful First Amendment activities. By recording and broadcasting the footage, which often contained close-up shots of the protesters' faces, the PPB subjected Portlanders to surveillance for their political activities without a criminal justification and made people attending the protests vulnerable to identification, federal monitoring, and doxing. When the PPB openly violates ORS 181A250, there's little reason to believe that their behavior is unimpeachable behind closed doors. And as many of our community partners will speak to shortly in their own testimony, the FBI's track record with unfounded invasive surveillance is no better and also often targets Black, Muslim, Arab, and other BIPOC communities. So given the long and recent history of both agencies chilling surveillance practices, and given the city's commitment to improving trust between Portlanders and the city, we request that at a bare minimum, the JTTF annual report be furnished with additional details to help increase transparency around the partnership between the PPB and FBI. We have seen more details in the past few years, but I list several specific requests about the report in my written testimony that I ask you to look over and please request those additional important details. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Jude. Marlene Wallingford. Hello. Hello. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, glad to be here. I've been here before. Um, I am a member of the Portland JCL, which began in 1928 to help young Japanese American citizens become civically engaged. So we are the oldest, one of the oldest, are the oldest civil rights organization, Asian American civil rights organization in the nation. In 1942, our immigrant parents were not allowed to become American citizens. So we faced racism that led to our forced removal from the West Coast because of fear. Now, the fear of terrorism in the aftermath of 9-11 has allowed us to undermine our constitutional rights. Um, our lives were changed forever when Pearl Harbor was attacked by 2.30 in that afternoon. Uh, the FBI swarmed over the Japanese neighborhood and arrested our community leaders. A total of 110 individuals were taken by the FBI for, and, and for several days, their families and um, wives had no idea what had happened to their husbands and fathers. Uh, none of these people were ever found guilty of sabotage. Uh, on February 9th of 1942, uh, February 19th of 42, the Portland City Council adopted Resolution 22113 to call for the removal of people of Japanese, of Japanese ancestry from the coast and be kept under surveillance of the government. So this was just as soon as President Roosevelt signed the executive order 9066. The FBI had been investigating the Japanese community as well as the German and Italian communities that had come up with a list of suspicious people before Pearl Harbor. Uh, individuals and organizations were grouped according to uh, ABC lists, according to their perceived threat of, uh, to our national security. So false rumors sensationalized by the media and politicians overwhelmed the facts. And so we were denied our due process because we look like the enemy. Uh, we are speaking today because even though it's 82 years later, the FBI is continuing to use a he used flawed theories. In 1942, we had no allies, and we don't want that to happen to any other group because of who they are. Uh, in, a, in the aftermath of 9-11, the Patriot Act was passed. This act gave increased powers and in investigation to the FBI. Uh, in fact, uh, after 9-11, the FBI came around to my father's neighbor because he happened to be from Iran. So that did happen after 9-11. Crime data shows that 
far-right extremists, including white supremacists and anti-government extremism, are behind more plots and attacks than Islamic extremists. Um, our local police department should not be conducting investigations without just cause. Uh, for Japanese Americans, our rallying cry has been Remember the Camps. As Frank Chin wrote, uh, Remember the Camps warns against the dark inside of America's, America's heart. And I want to thank the Portland City Council for uh, uh, standing up for the rights of our citizens and only working with the JTF on a limited basis. Thank you. Thank you. Brandon Mayfield. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Brandon Mayfield. I'm an American Muslim attorney who was targeted by the Portland JTTF working under the supervision of the FBI almost 20 years ago. And the FBI, unlike the local police, has a long history of targeting Muslims and continues to do so, including African Americans, immigrants, minorities, and civil rights advocates. I was personally affected by their bias and the Portland JTTF helped facilitate the religious targeting of myself and Muslim associates without any probable cause that I'd committed a crime. I was arrested on May 6, 2004 in connection with the Madrid bombing on the basis of a faulty fingerprint identification and every justification beside the fingerprint that, the, that they knew the Spanish police had determined was not a match had to do with my being a Muslim or associating with Muslims or representing Muslims. Put quite simply, I was arrested for being Muslim and associating with Muslims in the FBI, U.S. Attorney's Office, and Portland JTTF procured information about Muslims that they otherwise legally could not have. The mission of the FBI and the local police are not the same. The FBI's main function, as its name suggests, is to investigate violations of federal crimes, while the Portland Police Bureau's primary function is to serve and protect, and it's up to, hold, to uphold the Oregon State and Portland City laws and ordinances. The Portland Police Bureau should continue to maximize its limited and valuable resources to further this noble end. I've been in the Portland metro area since 2001 and can tell you from experience that since that time, the local FBI have been questioning Muslims at home and at work and intimidating them into answering questions without the assistance of counsel, of which has increased dramatically, particularly against Palestinians since the bombing in Gaza last October. And at least one since a local American Muslim from Portland was tortured for several months in the UAE in coordination with the FBI, the Portland FBI, and prevented from flying back to Portland. The FBI, on behalf of the U.S. Attorney's Office, are paying informants to keep tabs on local Muslims coming and going to our local mosque and in our, in our local communities. The local FBI have conducted raids and searches, member, searches on members of our local Somali, Somali community and the FBI, DOJ, and local JTTFs are targeting at-risk use and luring them into sting operations when they are not otherwise predisposed to commit violent crimes. Muhammad, Muhammad Usman, otherwise known as the Christmas tree bomber, is a perfect example, one that even the local federal judge assigned to the case described as These sting operations are not just bigoted oversight of the past, but are continuing to this very day, as made evidence by the arrest last month of an 18-year-old autistic Muslim youth in Colorado, groomed by the FBI since he was 16 years old. I want to thank the city and the police department for the corrections that were made on last year's annual report, and with the exception of the lack of detailed information and the spy on your neighbor encouragement at the end of the current report, which fosters suspicion, not friendship and partnership. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Dan Handelman, Portland Cop Watch. Welcome, Dan. Uh, good uh, afternoon, uh, City Council. Um, I'm Dan Handelman with Peace and Justice Works and its project group, Portland Cop Watch. You may know that Portland Cop Watch discovered the Joint Terrorism Task Force Agreement between the FBI and Portland Police hidden on the consent agenda back in November 2000. For over 23 years, we've been organizing with other people in the community to make sure Portland Police follow state law, protecting people's rights, um, law enforcement, Spying, particularly the, by the FBI, has infringed on people of color, labor organizers, environmental activists, civil rights activists, immigrants, Muslims, and others. After the 2010 FBI sting against Mohammed Mahmoud, centering on Pioneer Courthouse Square, the city re-entered its agreement with the FBI after having been out for six years. To mitigate the problems of secrecy that plagued the JTTF before Mayor Tom Potter pulled Portland out, the Bureau was supposed to give annual reports on their work with the JTTF from 2012 to 2015. Those were even more inadequate than the reports you've been getting since 2020, including this year's. 
In previous reports, there's been some hint as to why the Bureau or the FBI thought a case might involve, quote, unquote, terrorism. This year, there are three cases the FBI asked the Bureau to help with, but no indication at all what the substance is. Even if these are ongoing investigations, it hardly seems they would be tainted by saying something like involving the threat of violence against community members to advance a political agenda. The last seven cases are still open uh, from last year, and only six of them were identified this year. Two were referred to the Behavioral Health Unit as non-criminal offenses. Three were closed due to lack of tangible leads regarding vandalism to houses of worship in downtown buildings. And the last was a white male who made threats of violence who was deemed not to pose an actual danger. The Bureau is not required to list the details of the cases it sends to the FBI, but continues to do so as a courtesy. This year, they sent a case to the FBI about a white male making a threat against a Portlander over social media. The outcome of this case is not included. The PPB posts its internal JTTF directive annually, and we've asked that they add to their policy that reports include these cases, outcomes, and explanations of how the cases fit into the resolution's narrow scope. TJW and Copwatch continue to call upon the city to engage with the FBI when a case arises where their lives truly endangered due to politically motivated violence, but to stop deputizing two officers for the occasional team-ups, which seem to lead nowhere. The first draft of last year's report made reference to U.S. troops being withdrawn from Afghanistan as a reason to be on alert that a new, quote, terrorist threat might come up. Appropriately, council made PPB rewrite that report. This year, there's still a lot of post-9-11 language calling on people to, quote, see something and see something. This country is divided enough without encouraging everyone to think of their neighbors as criminals. When we look at the abuses of civil rights coming directly from the federal government and often from the PPB themselves, it may be worthwhile for the city to tone down the rhetoric and clean up its own act first. As a side note, I contacted the Bureau in early January to see when the report would be ready and never heard back. The council clerk would not tell me last Tuesday if it had been turned in. The mayor's office let me know it would be on this week's agenda. If the city values transparency. Reports should be posted once they're ready to present, not just five days before the hearing. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Debbie Iona. <clears throat> Hello, um, I'm Debbie Iona, representing the League of Women Voters of Portland. The League first commented on the city's involvement in the JTTF in 2001. We appreciate the annual reports and the opportunity to testify today. Our interest in this issue uh, stems from our mission to promote active and informed participation in government. We believe democracy is strengthened when people vote express their views before a decision-making body, or join in a demonstration. In Oregon, we are fortunate that state law protects participation in First Amendment activities. On the other hand, FBI actions in Oregon and around the country raise concerns that those protections may be ignored when Portland police work with federal agents. These concerns can and do have a chilling effect on public involvement activism, and lawful dissent. In the last few years, news reports covering FBI interactions with members of the public underscore the importance of maintaining vigilance over their work with our police bureau. A 2019 Guardian story revealed that the FBI, along with local law enforcement, tracked environmental and indigenous activists opposing the Jordan Cove LNG terminal. Last fall, The Intercept published a report on the continued surveillance by local police and federal agents of the Southern Oregon activists, in spite of the fact that the project had been canceled. Recent news points to FBI exploitation of people who may be susceptible to their influence. The last member of the Newburgh, New York Corps was recently ordered released from prison. The judge wrote that the FBI invented a conspiracy and sought out these men at, as their targets. She characterized the final man to be released as incapable of the conspiracy, given his, in quotes, well-documented buffoonery and ineptitude, end quote. More recently, an 18-year-old man with autism was arrested at the Denver airport on, his, on the way to Dubai to join ISIS. For two years, FBI agents posing as ISIS members encouraged him to support the organization, and once he turned 18, they arrested him. This year's JTTF report notes that two of the 2022 cases the FBI referred to the Portland police were passed on to the Behavioral Health Unit. It is encouraging to see that when it appears there may be a mental health issue, 
Portland police are able to avoid criminalizing the action. In conclusion, the league encourages the city to exercise caution when working with the FBI. In Oregon, we value our right to engage in political speech, and we also believe it is essential to protect our most vulnerable community members from unjust prosecution. Thank you for considering our comments. And I did put links to the articles in my written testimony if any of you are interested in reading them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Debbie. That completes testimony, Mayor. All right, very good. Colleagues, any questions at this particular juncture? This is a report, I'll entertain a motion to accept it. So moved. Commissioner Mapps moves. Can I get a second? Second. Commissioner Gonzalez seconds any further discussion. Seeing none, please call the roll. Rubio. I wanna thank Chief Day and Sergeant Friedman for this presentation and for those who provided testimony on the report. I also want to appreciate the increased detail from last year. It's what we asked for, and it's great to have more context um, and information. So thank you for being responsive. Um, I also want to acknowledge the real concerns and history that some folks brought up um, behind why there was a, a push to disengage some time ago. I worked for Mayor Potter during that time, and there were very real concerns back then in that time. Um, and examples by community of religious and racial targeting. And it's important to not forget that, but it's also important uh, to remember that there were applied learnings from that time. Um, also important to acknowledge is that the practice and transparency of this has continued to evolve. Since that time, especially in, the, the, in light of the rise of white nationalism and violence towards uh, people of color and religious communities and LGBTQIA, this partnership has evolved to become more transparent and more focused on specific kinds of work with de defined parameters and oversight. Um, and this is an ensur ensuring safety for all members of the public. So there are complexities and dimensions to this partnership, yes. Um, and that's why we all stay vigilant. Um, and so I appreciate the community reminding us of that history. And I also appreciate the current attention of PPB in applying it judiciously. So for these reasons, um, I vote aye to accept the report. Ryan. Yeah, I uh, thank you, Commissioner Rubio. Uh, I agree with many of your sentiments. I also really want to say that it was great to have the report, but with the testimony, um, we, we need to always be reminded of the history. And this partnership is important, though, because without it, we, have, we lose access to information and resources <coughs> and PB, PB we cannot do it alone. We need our intelligence that comes from the federal government. Um, it's important that we keep monitoring this partnership closely, and I accept the report. Gonzalez. Um, I'm going to vote to accept this report. I think cooperation between the FBI and Portland Police is essential uh, in keeping our community safe, keeping protecting our country. Um, I do want to emphasize that the calls for transparency is a two-way street. Uh, I do think some of the advocates get, have to answer for some pieces of this. There was allusion to the lawsuit over the 2020 uh, television or broadcasting of the riots downtown. It was one of the clearest ways for people to see the real damage being done by the riots. And in the name of um, transparency, I think we need to keep that front and center. With that, I vote aye. Maps. Aye. Mueller. I want to also acknowledge that while the history is important, the relationship between the Portland Police Bureau and the FBI has significantly improved in recent years. And I'm very appreciative of the partnership <coughs> and the sharing of information that we do have. I think it's totally appropriate that this council stay on top of the types of communication. But folks, we live in a world where not everybody wants to get along. And we need to have a realistic, real-time view of what the potential threats are to our community. And that's what the FBI focuses on, and we need access to that partnership. And so I think a good balance was struck here, and I'll just remind people that every couple of years, the question of the city's participation in the JTTF comes to city council. It will undoubtedly come again uh, I was opposed to removing the city of Portland from the Joint Terrorism Task Force. I believe as the police commissioner, that is the right decision to make. 
but I also appreciate that there was a compromise here in terms of the kind of information that would be provided publicly to council. And I think we've struck a good balance. The relationship continues to be strong and I believe productive for the Portland Police Bureau. Therefore, I vote aye and the report is accepted. Thank you. 103, this is a second reading. Authorized short-term subordinate urban renewal and redevelopment bonds on behalf of Prosper Portland to finance projects in urban renewal areas. Just as a reminder, this is the uh, technical requirement authorizing the city to issue taxable short-term bonds on behalf of Prosper Portland so they can continue to fund projects within urban renewal areas with existing tax increment financing. Is there any further discussion on this item? Seeing none, please call the roll. Rubio. Um, I want to thank the OMF and Revenue Team for work, working with the team at Prosper for bringing this item forward to Council. And it, I think it bears repeating that this is not a new tax. This is in alignment with the already approved and existing TIP plans, which of course have had community engagement um, to create them. Uh, these are resources that are already built into the city's budget and forecast. Um, and so uh, thank you again, and I vote aye. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Miller. Aye. The ordinance is adopted. 104, also a second reading. Add utility operators code to govern utility access and use of the city right of way and adopt fee schedule for utilities operating in the city right of way. Any further discussion? Please call the roll. Rubio. I'd like to thank Andrew Spear and Director Oliveira for their hard work on this. Andrew uh, took all the comments and questions raised back in June and brought together all the stakeholders uh, to work on this important ordinance that will streamline the way the city manages access to the right of way. This has been a multi-year project and I'm happy to see this ordinance moving us in the right direction with a path forward to create alignment for all who can access the right of way. So I'm happy to vote aye on this ordinance. Ryan. Yes, I want to echo some of my comments from last week. Andrew Spear, you're out there, so there you are. Um, again, thank you so much for um, following up. We all got flooded with calls last June, and there were some really uh, helpful concerns that were lifted, and you got in there and worked on this, and it's a new policy. It's uh, crickets uh, the last two weeks. That says a lot. Um, that's really hard to do when it comes to policy. So it's clear today that all that work and that engagement's paid off. Uh, good legislation. I vote aye. I, I vote aye. Maps. Aye. Miller. Aye. The ordinance is adopted. 105, also a second reading. Authorized competitive solicitation and execution of price agreements for sodium hypochlorite for a map not to exceed $12,500,000 over five years. Any further discussion on this item? Seeing none, please call the roll. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Miller. Aye. Ordinance is adopted. 106, second reading. Amend tax rate code to extend a heavy vehicle use tax to fund Portland street repair, maintenance, and traffic safety program. Any further discussion? Seeing none, call the roll. Rubio. I want to thank uh, Commissioner Maps for his leadership on this, and also thank you, Bot Team, for your continued work on this program. Um, I believe we need to approve this funding to make sure we can continue the critical safety improvements and maintenance of our roads to ensure all users can access safely. I vote aye. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Miller. Aye. The ordinance is adopted. We'll go back to the items on the consent that were withdrawn. Please read items 98 and 99 together. They are both first readings of non-emergency ordinances. Item 98, authorized contract with Prologis LP to fund 30 years of anticipated power and maintenance costs for a new traffic signal at North Schmier Road and North Whitaker Road for $150,000. Item 99, authorized contract with Prologis LP to fund 30 years of anticipated power and maintenance costs for a new traffic signal and North Schmier Road in Northeast Vancouver Way, North Vancouver Avenue for $150,000. Commissioner Maps. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Colleagues, uh, these two items were originally placed on consent, uh, but were pulled off by a member of the public. Let me provide you with some brief context for this, and then I'll in invite a member of uh, the Peabot staff to uh, flesh out the details. Uh, of course, this item comes to us from the Bureau of Transportation. The purpose 
these ordinances is to authorize a standard maintenance agreement with Prologis for anticipated power and maintenance costs for a new traffic signal. Uh, we have Charles Radosta, engineering supervisor with Peabot, to tell us more about this item. Charles, are you here? There you go. I think Charles is online. Can you hear me? Okay? Yep. Very good. Yeah, I, I, you you hit that hit the highlights. We we're just uh, able to seek some maintenance funding compensation from the developer for these two new traffic signals, which frankly are going in mostly to their benefit and less to the benefit of the general users of the of the city. And so this is just an opportunity for us to try to capture some of the ongoing maintenance responsibilities that we'll have as a bureau to keep those signals up and operational. Great, thanks, Charles. Do we have, um, I think we have some uh, public testimony on this, <coughs> colleagues. How many people do we have signed up? We have one person signed right, up. That's sure. Mark Porras. Yep, can you hear me? Yeah. Fantastic, good afternoon, Mayor Commissioners. Uh, my name is Mark Porras, I use he and pronouns. And I'm just testifying as a plain old member of the public. I appreciate the PBOT um, employee explaining what's going on here. Um, I want to thank you for making this a regular ordinance to give the city time to make changes before approving it. Uh, exhibit B attached to the ordinance states that Prologis shall promptly pay to the city a one-time lump sum uh, in the amount of $150,000 to cover the anticipated power and maintenance costs for the signal improvements for the following 50 years. Um, and the impact statement states uh, pretty similar except for 30 years. Um, so there's a 20-year 20, uh, 20 difference there. So either the agreement covers the anticipated costs until 2054 or 2074. And just wanna make sure you know what you're approving before doing so. The ordinance also states that the proposed traffic signal will primarily serve Amazon delivery vehicles only interrupting through traffic when Amazon vehicles enter or exit the facilities in the area. Uh, Amazon's currently listed as having the fifth largest market capitalization in the world at around $1.6 trillion. Prologis states on its website that it's the largest industrial property owner in Portland. Whereas of 2023 Q4, they have over 55 industrial real estate properties totaling 7 million square feet and that serve 115 customers. Uh, Prologis is a real estate investment trust with a market capitalization of $119 billion. So both Amazon and Prologis are members of the Portland Business Alliance. Uh, neither Amazon nor Prologis filed lobbying entity statements with the city for 2023 Q4. However, uh, the Portland Business Alliance filed the longest one at six pages long and accounting for 151 of the 253 contacts with city employees. That's from the underlying data. Uh, the $150,000 Prologis is giving the city for this traffic signal. It feels like unofficial lobbying. Uh, the ordinance also states that the agreement does not include costs associated with anticipated inflation. Uh, it feels like Prologis and Amazon could afford to pay rates that keep up with inflation instead of passing those costs along to the taxpayers. Uh, so I was wondering why that's not taken into account. And um, please consider putting items like this on the regular agenda to increase transparency when it comes to corporate funding of city infrastructure. And so I don't have to testify on item 99. <clears throat> I just want to um, uh, add off topic that I appreciate you allowing the gentleman who showed up to testify today off topic during the central city concern item. I, I appreciate you allowed him to finish what he had to say. And also off topic, the way council interacted with another community member who was testifying off topic last week was demeaning. And in the future, I hope you're all able to hold each other accountable for the way you treat members of the public. And it's probably not too late to apologize to that person. Thank you. Uh, Mark, thank you. And I, I just want to point out, we have council rules and they are read in advance of the meeting. And if people choose to participate in this forum, which they're certainly welcome to do, we ask them to stay on topic. This is actually the business meeting for the city of Portland. And uh, if people want to talk on any topic whatsoever, they're able to sign up for communications. And the individual that uh, I closed down last week knows that because she has participated in communications on many occasions. She was off topic. She was making racist comments. She was attempting, I think, just to insult people. Um, and while ordinarily those would be First Amendment rights, uh, the bottom line is during our business meetings, we have clearly stated rules that we expect everybody to follow. And it was for that reason that after about a minute of her testimony, I asked her to either make it relevant or stop. In fact, I think I just said stop at that point. She's, she's well known here. So that's my point. Um, no, understood, I will not, I understood. Will not, and I will not be apologizing. Thank you for asking, though. I wasn't actually talking to you. Maps. That's okay. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I wanted to invite Charles to come back in here. I, I think Mark raised a question about uh, maybe the, the duration of uh, these two ordinances. That struck me as being important. And Mark, I'll be transparent with you. I, I didn't follow the argument you were making on the lobbying thing, but I do want to make sure that um, at least we don't have the Scribner's error in the contracts. Charles, did, uh, do you see what Mark was talking about? And do we have a problem? There is a there is a typo in the exhibit B. Thanks for pointing that out. We, it should be thirty years at five thousand a year, and I apologize I didn't catch the uh, I didn't catch that in the exhibit B that the fifty years is a, is an error. Uh, it, the the bottom line is the dollar amount is is what we're seeking. The years is just kind of the, how the math was created. Okay, great, uh, Mark. Thanks for the catch. I'll work with uh, staff to figure out what to do. Mr. Mayor, I think that these are first readings, so um, give me a week and I'll figure out what, how to proceed. Perfect, sounds good. Uh, number, and thank you, Mark, for, for catching that. Item 98 is the first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. It moves to second reading. Item 99, likewise, is the first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. It moves to second reading. Keelan, that completes our business for this morning, yes. part of the afternoon. All right. Thanks, everybody, for sticking in there. It was a long morning. We are adjourned. <laughs>